This interview with Chibi is the longest interview I've recorded so far. Yes, looking at three hours feels like a long time. Yet for both Chibi and me, this interview was over before we knew it. That's what you get when you have old friends that meet each other again after way too long. We talked about how he changed from his judgmental view of others to having more empathy for them and himself. Two, how focusing on the process and not on the results actually helped him to create better results. Three, how showing trust to managers has as an effect that these same managers show trust to their teams. And four, that it's more important to build systems that allow you to change your mind than to build perfect systems. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did recording it. I'm Yves Hanul from Who's Agile. My pronouns are he and him. Welcome to my channel. You see a lot of Agilists around me on this screen. If you want to hear me interviewing, please click that subscribe button because these are the people that I've invited so far. If you think I'm missing people, let me know in the comments. And that like button, well, if you liked today's interview, don't forget to click it. So, hello and welcome, Chibi. Hi, it's, it's great to be here. Thanks very much for inviting me. And well, to jump right into here, what does that mean? Let me see if this works. It should work. Yes. So here for me is in Belgium. Uh, I'm here and here for you is uh, in Canada. And what was it again? Summerside, if I remember correctly. Yeah, Summerside, and, Prince Edward Island. And that brings us more or less where you are. Yes, uh, it's probably probably not the exact location, but that's not the goal. Um, that's uh, just show people a little bit of, uh, of where you are, and let's uh, bring you back online. Take Google away. Um, and what, another thing that uh, we asking for me, it's uh, what is it? Fifteen minutes after five uh, on a Monday evening. What's the the time zone, or what time is it on your side? Yeah, so we're actually one. We're we're in the time zone that only one of the time zones that only Canada has. Uh, so we are uh, one hour farther east of Toronto and New York. So right now it's quarter afternoon for me uh, on Monday. So so it's a, a whole different. My day is almost at the end, and you're you're only halfway. So that's indeed uh, that's that's. Okay, and well, we've jumped right into that, but uh, TV, tell us a little more. Who are you? What do you want people to know about you? Uh, for the people who uh, well, I, I'm an old extreme programming dude. Uh, I uh, became interested in uh, what we now think of as the Agile community uh, very early on as extreme programming was becoming popular in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And... Mm. Uh, I spent uh, probably about 10 years being very involved in the Agile community and a little bit in the leadership and being involved in the Agile Alliance. I spent a few years on the on the uh, board of directors the of board. the Agile Alliance, um, and I've been involved in, in uh, trying to organize uh, some aspects of the, the big North American Agile Conference, especially when it still came to Canada, which it hasn't done in a long time. And um, and these days, um, you know, I've I've spent most of the last ten years uh, more wandering around Europe. Uh, sort of found that I was doing more uh, work with European clients and uh, attending mm -hmm. more European conferences. And so, uh, in the days before we had global travel shutdowns. Um, uh, my wife and I would spend uh, three months essentially living part-time in Europe each year. Uh, the last several years, uh, home base had been Stockholm. So we've been sort of part-time Swedes, uh, but we're still full-time Canadians in case anyone from the Canadian government is, is watching. <laughs> yeah. I remember that, that you've been, well, actually you've been to Belgium to the, the XP Day uh, Benelux conference as well. I remember correctly. Yeah, that was kind of a, at the beginning of when we began to uh, to travel and work in Europe more extensively. So it's been really nice to get the chance, especially now that we live in quite a small community uh, in Atlantic Canada, 
it's really nice to be able to come to Europe and sort of rent the big cities a little bit at a time and, and get a chance to live part time in, in Stockholm or Bratislava or Prague or any of these places, uh, pretty much anywhere that uh, I think of them as sort of the pork based cultures. So it's all the places pretty much from Munich until um, until the Russian border. Uh, all those areas of Central Europe where uh, where uh, pork is a big part of the eating culture. That's sort of where we've where we've had our second home for uh, a good amount of the last ten years. It's interesting that you yeah you define it based on food and and, and based on looking at that. But it's well, it's a nice way of thinking. And we're also there mostly in the fall, so we try to uh, we try to spend as much time as we can at the Christmas markets. So that's why we're always trying to make sure that we're there between late November and the middle of December because that's uh, there are a few things more. I wish this is a culture that we could uh, uh, adopt in more of Canada where you can just walk through the streets with a nice glass of hot wine and, and the cold air and just enjoy being around people. It's, it's, it's definitely a nice part of, of the culture in Europe, I would say. Absolutely. Okay. Let's jump into that first question. What is something that, uh, and let me show, I'm not sure if it seems to be something strange today, but it seems to come on screen. What is something that people usually don't know about you, but, but has influenced you in, in the way you are? Well, this is something that I think that people are starting to learn about me as I have been uh, louder about it in the last several years. But um, I am a professional five pin bowler. Um, so yes. five pin bowling is a is a style of bowling which is only found in Canada. It's a variation of the bowling game, and um, and I've been strictly speaking a professional for the past um, five years or so, which means that I have in fact earned money as a bowler. Certainly not enough money to to give up my software uh, profession, but. Um, I travel to tournaments uh, throughout the year and uh, get the opportunity to compete at the highest level in Canada, which happens to also be the highest level in the year in the in the world. Sorry, and um, this has really changed the way that I practice um, software consulting um, over the last five years, as I have been learning about, especially the mental aspects of athletic competition and bowling is one of those concentration and focused kind of sports it's not so much it's not as much like football or baseball or hockey where you really need high fitness and it's uh reacting in the moment to what's happening it's more of the style of sport like golf or archery or any of these kinds of sports where you're trying to remain calm uh, strong concentration, strong focus, try to do the same thing over and over again. And a lot of what I've learned about relaxation, about um, mental preparation, about the importance of um, feeling ease, about confidence, those kinds of things, which are important in the athletic uh, world, have also been very valuable in uh, in managing our work as software professionals, that bringing this, I remember Brian Merrick talking a lot about ease and joy at work um, 15 years ago mm -hmm. when we had XP Day back in Toronto. Um, and I know that a huge part of extreme programming is this sort of lightweight feeling of working, of being able to take your time, pretend as though you have all the time that you need to do good work, attention to detail, those kinds of things. Um, I had understood them, but I understood them, I understand them much more deeply now in a way that I didn't even five years ago. And so I find that uh, a lot of what I'm learning about concentration, focus, uh, relaxation, um, about the mental aspects of sports have really started to change the way that I teach and practice, for example, test-driven development to programmers. Mm -hmm. I'm much more aware of it as a stress reduction mechanism 
rather than as only an effectiveness mechanism. So that's really changed the way that I, uh, it's also changed the way that I describe these practices to programmers. When I talk to managers, of course, I'm interested in, I want them to understand about effectiveness and efficiency and, and reducing waste and all those kind of lean things. But then when it's just the programmers, us talking with each other, I spend much more time thinking and talking about lower stress, greater concentration, uh, achieving flow, those kinds of things, uh, because of how they have uh, helped me in my in my athletic career. Interesting, because yeah, if I, if I look at at bowling, uh, I, I don't know the five pin bowling as much. Uh, like you say, it's usually it's only in Canada, but I've, I've followed you around a little bit on what you've been posting uh, online. Um, but but just thinking about it, it's it, for me it feels really like it's a competition against yourself because yes. really you 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 don't play against well you do play against other people but yeah you you don't have to push other people or things it's right. really just you throwing that ball to to say it uh, in in a not so nice way but yeah basically yeah. if you throw it better or, or worse it's really only you that you have to blame exactly uh, there is no defense in bowling. And in a way, there is also no strategy in bowling. Really, you're just trying to do the same thing. And each individual person, even if you play in a team, each person mm -hmm. is competing against the lane, against the conditions, the humidity in the air, or the you know how oily the lanes are, these kinds of things. Everyone is competing against one enemy, so to say, but they are... Each one is just trying to perform at their best, and they're trying to adapt to the changing conditions and perform at their best. There is no defense. I'm not knocking you out of the way. I'm not stopping you from throwing the ball. I'm not pushing you aside. And in that way, it's very much like software. I, I really like Alistair Coburn's um, you know, formulation of software as a cooperative game. Um, mm -hmm. Bowling is like that as well. Even when we do it as a team activity, it's a cooperative game. We're trying to support each other to have the best possible performance. But when it comes time to throw the ball, everyone is exactly. watching one person do it at a time. Mm -hmm. So it is very much this, uh, we, we help each other by supporting each other. We help each other by, um, by helping each other feel more relaxed or less stress. Or if you are the type who needs it, you know, more energy, more energetic. And in that way, um, the two are very similar. Uh, it's not the same as in other sports where you're trying to stop the other per the other person from scoring. There's, I think there's no defense in software as well. At least there shouldn't be defense in software. Sometimes it feels like other people are getting in our path, but I don't think that's intentional. Exactly. It's, it might not be intentional or, well, Maybe it's the, the, the people from security or whatever, but they still are in the same team in the sense that they want to help and to be the best program or the exactly. best environment. So it's it's definitely not intentional to, to break you. Uh, just like the person who oiled the, um, the lane it does, didn't do it intentionally, more or less oil or whatever uh, for, for the bowling. I mean, the person who... who helps and, and prepares the lanes for, for the competition is not doing something bad on purpose and probably more the opposite is one to make that yes. that lane as fast as possible and whatever. Yeah, it um, might not be what you like, but they're not trying to hurt you. Exactly. So that's, uh, that's uh, and you're all, if I, is this the same one, the way I think about bowling, you're all on the same lane. So when you're doing a competition, I, I assume your team and the, the other team, you're all on the same lane, I assume, that you are there. Yes. Uh, the, so it's, it's interesting that we move around so that, you know, there's many, many lanes in a bowling center. We're moving around. So the conditions will change from game to game. Mm -hmm. It could be a little bit different. Uh, not a big difference, but there are some, you know, some little things that you need to adapt to. But when your team and my team are bowling against each other, we are on one pair of lanes together for that game so for that moment at least just yeah. as it would be if you sit down to write software for two hours at least for that one period very little is changing and what we are trying to do is to figure out how to perform the best in those environments even if that environment will change in the afternoon or the next day 
because of lightning, because of humidity, because of whatever sunshine of, of, of uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> temperature, yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah, anything. Yeah. Like that. That's that's really interesting, and I can indeed I can imagine uh, that learning to well to compete to yourself and really learning to understand yourself definitely has an impact on on who you are as a, as a programmer and as a as a human being trying to explain stuff. If I just look at myself. I'm, I'm definitely not the same person that I was 30 years ago, and teaching things uh, will, will definitely happen in, in a different way. Uh, so that's uh, that's that's really interesting to to think about that. I didn't think about that before, but it's um, it's really thank you for sharing because that's um, that is indeed has a, has a big impact on us. Okay, let's move to the next question that and that is about if you had not been into IT, do you have any idea what would have become of you? If there, was there anything else in your path? Um, well, so as a profession, I'm not sure. I suppose there is another universe in which I would have tried to become a professional musician and probably I would be starving mm -hmm. right now as a musician. I might be some, you know, I might be some session player trying to find enough um you know enough jobs on playing background in on somebody's uh, album just to to try to survive uh, i might be in the street just uh, banging away on a piano keyboard hoping that somebody will throw a few dollars at me um, so i suppose that could have happened um, mm -hmm. but otherwise i mean i i i really i guess i would have been a teacher um, you know, I, I've, uh, I didn't realize it until maybe five years into my career as a programmer that I'm much more interested in helping other people p perform better than I am in my own performance. I mean, I, I, my interest in mm -hmm. software has much more to do with uh, helping people improve the way they work, both to be more effective, but also to be, as I've said before, more relaxed, uh, less stressful. And I think that uh, maybe that means that I would have been some kind of a teacher, although I don't know if I could have taught in a school. I don't think that would have been right for me, but I could imagine being um, either a university professor or being one of those people who tries to teach at you know the local community center, uh, even as a volunteer, that my, you know, I'm trying to help adults learn something of value to themselves uh, and then probably that means i would have to be some you know mathematics tutor or something in order to pay the bills so that i could then go to the community center and volunteer as a teacher teaching adults something i don't know but it, it it yeah it rings a bell to me because indeed like almost every time that i meet you or that i've met you over the years is when you've learned something new you try to to well radiate it or evangelize it to other people i remember lots of conversations i had with you about how, how to deal with money and how to yeah think yeah. about uh, about money so there is a lot of things and i've learned a lot from from some of the books that you shared and some of the discussions that we had uh, and so so not only about extreme programming tdd and all these kind of things but i, I think almost every time you learn something and you want to spread it to the rest of the world and, and like teaching all of us what um yeah what you've learned so i i recognize that that teaching part definitely yeah, and these days it's uh, it's more stuff related to psychology. As I'm trying to understand my own mind better and my own personality and my own ways of learning, um, of course, I immediately see uh, I immediately see how it applies both uh, in my athletic career and in my uh, professional career. And then it's it's impossible to stop myself from writing about it in one context or the other. And then it just becomes, and it's quite interesting because I, I, I often will write something which I intend for a, the bowling audience on social media, but it is then the software audience who maybe has more interesting things to say about it. And it, it becomes mm. now this little game that I can play where I just read something or I have a thought and I try to write it in such a way that the bowling people will think about it one way, the software people will think about it another way, but each group will get something from it and then i can feel a little bit like i'm uh like i'm teaching both at the same time it's uh, it's quite satisfying actually 
That's it's interesting because yeah, I, I've, I have um, a friend, uh, well actually someone who, um, by by coincidence, I'm wearing a T-shirt from Coder Dojo, and there was a lady that was there. Um, she's like 19 or 20, I think, right now, and she's um, a professional. Um, what is it? Not a wrestler, but she's um, she's in the Olympics with uh, with weights. So she's uh, doing okay. weights uh, weightlifting. Yeah. Um, and yeah, what I've learned, I, I don't I don't know anything about that sport. But since I've been following her, I, I learned a lot. And yeah, it's it's a lot about psychology. It's a lot about mental strength. And yeah, we we think it's this is physical strength. But what I've learned is that it it's a lot about mental strength. About okay. How do you prepare yourself, and how do you some? And there, of course, it is competing um, with the others, but at, at the same time, it's it's again competing with yourself because you have to put the weight on top of your head, uh, over your head. You don't do like you said; there is no defense or anything like that. But there is a mental game in the sense that sometimes they they play about I don't know what is it. Okay, now. I say I'm going to go for that uh, that weight, and then that puts stress on other people. So there's definitely a more a mind fuck and a mind game happening Absolutely. than there happens in bowling. I so. hadn't thought about the similarities to weightlifting, but there is a lot of similarity because often, uh, it's, I think it's more direct in weightlifting. But part of what is difficult for the individual performer is to you must be aware of comparing your performance to what other people are doing in that moment. When I'm at a bowling tournament, mm -hmm. of course, I can look at the scoreboards and I can see how my, uh, how uh, the rest of the competition, how they are performing. And it can be helpful at times to know where do I place? What do I need to think about? Can I relax? But ultimately, mm -hmm. uh, the strategy is always the same. You just try to perform the best you can and you hope that it's enough. And I, you know, so there's this constant balance of, on the one hand, it's, it's impossible to ignore what other people are doing. But on the other hand, that information is often not very valuable. In fact, that information often only hurts you. And it feels a lot like being aware of deadlines in software projects. Yes, mm -hmm. there's this deadline thing that everyone needs to be aware of, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, as Agilists, part of our, uh, Part of our philosophy is maximize value and produce as much value as you can, as early as you can, and hope that it's enough to make the stakeholders and the sponsors happy enough to keep paying you money. And in a very real sense, that's the only strategy that there is in this sort of incremental iterative way of doing uh, software. And being aware that you're 20% towards the deadline or 30% towards the deadline or 40% towards the deadline. It's this kind of information that many people focus on, but I think is only a distraction. I don't think it really mm -hmm. helps very much. At least it doesn't help if the people planning the project will not change their minds. If they can use that information to change their minds and to adapt the plan in order to change what we do, that's great. But it doesn't happen very often. And in environments like bowling or weightlifting or any of these kinds of sports, often that information doesn't change your strategy at all. So it's better just to ignore it, which is one of the reasons why I don't like to focus my energy on estimating the cost of software projects. I think that it's, for most people, most of the time, it's more of a distraction than it is helpful information in planning. Yeah, I, I recognize a lot of the things. Well, first of all, weightlifting. I think with Nina, what I see is that her coach is focusing on the strategy about, okay, what weight will you go? And she doesn't necessarily know what her competitors are doing. She might not look at the scoreboard because they try to to put these things again. Because like you say, she needs to focus and bring her best. And the other part about you say about the deadlines, uh, just yesterday, my, my son had a deadline for university to do a project and was like, okay, you need to focus, let just deliver, write something, upload it, commit it to, to your local GitHub so that your professor can see it and then do the next thing and the next thing. And 
if you don't make it, if you don't have everything by the deadline, just make sure that you make small steps, progress, that you that people see what you're doing and you do whatever. And in the end, he made it, or as, as, as far as I understand, he, he, he gave everything what, what he thought he needed to give. But it doesn't really matter. Even if you only have 60 or 80 percent, if you submit all the time, if you have multiple parts, you do the best what you can. And, and trying to write everything and then upload it in one large blog, well, doesn't help, especially if you're working in a team like uh, like team. Well, development in most cases is teamwork, like you said yeah. earlier on. So um, we, we want actually to uh, to to deliver our uh, stuff in small chunks so that our our friends can see what we've done and maybe jump in and help out, test something, whatever, and and, and do something else. Um, and they might surprise you to fix something because i do remember that uh, my son yesterday said he was uploading something and uh, of course we, you you do a pull just before and said oh my friend fixed this part and i was thinking about i need to fix it and my friend already fixed it so that's nice so that's um, and that's a little bit what it is eh? what development is you you work together you collaborate and like you say you you do it in small chunks absolutely Thank you for sharing. These are interesting conversations there that we have. And let's go to that next question. What's the biggest challenge that you have or the biggest one that you want to share? Because uh, sometimes people tell me afterwards, well, there was a big one, but I don't want to put it on camera. So right. <laughs> what's something you want to share? Um, yeah, I don't mind talking about this. I think it is. Uh, it has been uh, one of my biggest challenges, uh, certainly over the last Oh, geez, now probably 15 years. Um, so I, early in my career, I dealt with some quite serious burnout uh, and depression uh, symptoms. And I, it's one of the reasons why I became interested in, um, in concepts in psychology. I had a very practical reason to care about these topics. Uh, it was not uh, an academic exercise for me. I needed to better understand how my mind worked and especially some of the ways in which it seemed to be failing to work. And, um, and so, you know, that's led to a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, reading, a lot of uh, uh, screaming and crying and uh, a lot of confusion. And, um, and I think one thing that it's, one of the ways I think that it's really helped me is to, develop much more compassion for other people who are struggling to achieve something. And when I say struggle, I mean struggle in the, in the clinical sense, the neutral sense. Not that they're having difficulty, but that it's not easy for them. They have to work. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I think it was very easy for me early in my life, probably until the age of, say, 27, 28, to have a very judgmental view about other people's motivation and how that motivation um, manifested in what they did. That it was very easy for me to uh, assume that other people were choosing not to try hard, were maybe lazy or were easily distracted or... Um, I had very, uh, a very strong blaming way of seeing how other people acted. And so especially when I felt pressure to achieve something and I'm relying on other people to help me do it, then it became very easy to adopt a blaming attitude towards uh, those situations where they let me down. And I think that, mm. um, you know, I have some, I have some genetic advantages um, regarding how my brain works and how easily I learn things and how quickly I match patterns. And these are just, some of them were, some of them are genetic advantages. Some of them are, um, unintentional habits of childhood, you know, reading things that other kids didn't read, uh, uh, uh being interested in mathematics and, and building up, uh, uh, uh this skill even before I understood what I was doing and how it would be helpful. And that made it very easy for me to adopt a judgmental view of what other people were doing, because I assumed that they had the same opportunities and would do the same thing that I did when, of course, they didn't. 
And man, you thought, okay, that they don't do it because they're lazy or they're not interested, right. where in yeah. reality it was because they didn't have that habit or they didn't have the capabilities that you had. Exactly. Or whatever. It, it, it doesn't really matter. They, they, uh, but you, you thought it was a conscious choice where for them, even if there was a conscious choice, well, even if there was a choice, it might not have been a conscious one. Yeah. And, uh, it's definitely or, not out of laziness. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it really, I think for me in the beginning, I was very aware of how judgmentally I was treating other people and I started trying to do some things to, to fix that. Um, and then really over time, I began to understand just the huge variety of how humans perceive the world. This began to become quite interesting to me. I don't know, I'm not an expert in this area at all, but I think I have a much better appreciation for just how much difference there is in how we experience the world from person to person. And that, you know, if there's this cliche that everyone grows up believing that everyone in the world is like them. And I think it was relatively easy to discover that this wasn't true. But I, every year now, as I read more, as I think about this more, and as I try to work with more people, I just get even more and more an appreciation for the variety of experiences. And so uh, this has allowed me to, you know, to just to view other people with so much more compassion than I did 15 years ago. And then, of course, that's been as important for myself, that uh, when my mind doesn't do what I want it to do, when I don't feel the energy that I want to feel, when I don't feel the concentration that I want to feel, when I struggle to do something which used to be easy or which would be easy at another time, I have a lot more compassion for myself. And ironically, that makes it easier for me to perform better at whatever I'm doing. If I have more compassion for myself during the low energy or the low concentration periods, then it becomes much easier to recover and it becomes much easier to get more out of what I, out of my own abilities because I put is, so is that, pressure on myself. Yeah, I was about to ask, is that because you, you spent so much, otherwise you spent so much brain cycles on getting out of it or, or getting annoyed with yourself? Yes. That it actually help, doesn't help you, okay. And so when yeah. you're more at ease with what's happening with yourself, you can let it go and all of a sudden there is more capacity for, from your brain to actually solve it and then to get out of it. Absolutely, yes. And, it, so, and so all of it becomes this beautiful... Um, self-supporting cycle where if I have more compassion for myself, I'm wasting less energy on criticizing myself. Then I have more energy that I can give to you. But it's more mm -hmm. than just this. I don't just have more energy to give to you, but I have more compassion to give to you. And when I give that compassion to you, you feel less stress, you feel less pressure. It's easier for you to perform. You can give more of that back to me. And now suddenly, it's not just that I feel less stress. It's that we feel less stress with each other. Mm -hmm. And there's more that we can give to the people who surround us, which then gives them more capacity to give to each other, and it only gets better. And uh, this is a very strange thing for my, you know, my programmer brain to appreciate. And I think that's, again, it's an area where, um, it's the one thing that I definitely did not expect to learn. If you asked me 20 years ago, what would I be interested in learning now? I would never have imagined any of this because I was still so much focused on the craft of programming and the technology and those aspects of it. But it's so much more meaningful to me now to experience software development as a social activity uh, where by coincidence, the outcome is working software which helps other people solve problems. I like that because it reminds me also about the fact that, well, 
what we see a lot in, in you talked about estimation and effectiveness and efficiently and we see a lot of uh, managers focusing on efficiency and the more people want us to focus on efficiency the less effective we are and less efficient we are in the end yes but it, it, it's very strange and people want us to focus so much on the same thing with money the more you focus on saving money in a project the, the worse it gets there's a lot of statistics about that but it's it, it's very strange and yeah basically what you're saying is in our brains it's, it's working in the same way um very interesting and I've, I've had similar kind of experiences um and indeed also with my children the more i would if i would focus on stressing them you have to work and you have to uh, it, it won't help them um and the hard part is even as a parent you know that because you've been there or you, like you say we we know kind of how it works but at the moment when things happen it might still be there it's it's yeah it, it reminds me a lot about for example uh afraid of heights i am I'm, I'm really afraid of heights and i know it's uh, illogical and i know yeah there's not much risk and whatever but it doesn't help once i'm there right. somewhere and and i have that stress it's there and there's no way i can avoid it or well the, the way to avoid it is indeed like you say to become more calm and to 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 ignore it kind of thing and then things might uh might work out better but it's it's really hard it's, uh... yeah and this is it's it, funny this is uh, i'm now realizing this is an area where what i learned from extreme programming and uh in the early days uh actually becomes helpful in a athletic career because you know at the time we were focused very much on technique we were focused on understanding mm -hmm. what what things should we do in order to perform better? What kinds of techniques should we use? What, uh, how do we adjust our technique? And very much our focus was on the craft, the technique, and less about the results. Even though, of course, our sponsors, our managers, our project managers are very interested in the results. We taught ourselves and taught each other to focus on the techniques. And this has become very popular in sports psychology now in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, maybe longer, to be, uh, they use the terms in English, to be process-oriented instead of results-oriented. That, yes, of course, mm -hmm. there is a scoreboard, and the highest score is what wins all the competition, and who wins the competition wins all the money. But the best way to perform better seems to be to focus on the process Whatever your process, athletic process is, the specific techniques, the muscle movements, the, the training regimen, any of those things. And the results, the score on the scoreboard will take care of itself. And this is an area where if you rewind 20 years, I didn't know that that's what I was learning. I didn't realize that when I was practicing test first programming or when I was practicing uh, planning every week and adjusting our plans, when I was practicing these kinds of things, that really we were focusing on the process instead of on the results. And the results, the better results happened because we were focusing on the process and not the other way around. And I think that's something that uh, maybe if I had a time machine, it would be nice to go back and to and tap tell yourself on the shoulder and say, you should pay more attention to this point <laughs> because it will help you with other things as well. It's, it's, it's interesting because it, it reminds me also my, my son, my, one of my sons played basketball and I sometimes get annoyed with some of the coaches, luckily mostly from from other teams, not from, from my son's team, but when they start shouting and, and really focusing on, yeah, on, on the game board, uh, basically. And really, for me, the, the real work that a coach has to do is, is in between the matches and, and focus indeed on the techniques. And you know, when, when yeah, the basketball is, is throwing in, into the ring basically and so yeah there is there is uh, defense and there is other things but really you need to be able to score as well and uh, and what i see is the more they 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 practice these kind of skills the better they are and the better they are at, at some of the techniques that helps and really and that's really what you you want to focus on for me as a coach and in a match shouting about i don't know what yeah it's probably adding a lot of stress but i'm not sure if it's helping 
at that level. That's I, I, I'm pretty sure that the players on the court are always trying to score as many points as they can, and they're always trying to stop the opposition from scoring as well as they can. And it's the same as the manager who, in frustration, is yelling about the progress towards the deadline. Um, the programmers, the testers, everyone who is producing this software, they're probably already doing the best that they can. And, mm -hmm. uh, and if they're not, that's a different, if they are intentionally not performing at their best, that's a different, the, the, that's a different discussion to have. And uh, it, it always surprises me. Well, not it doesn't, but it's uh, when I get an opportunity to speak in a quiet moment with a manager or with a project manager, someone in this kind of responsibility role, and I ask them directly, do you honestly believe that those people over there are not doing the best that they know how to do they all yeah. i've never had someone say no they've always said yes i i i know they are doing the best that they can or at mm -hmm. least i feel confident that they're doing the best that they can okay well and so, if, if they're not then why are they still here i mean well, that, that's yeah, that's that's the different that's the different conversation exactly and exactly. so and and again this is one of those areas where compassion has really changed the way i practice because in the past i would just look at that manager in the face and say okay well then what the hell is wrong with you why do you insist on yelling at them that the deadline is coming they know it doesn't help them and now i can say to them okay so now can we uh, are you willing to talk to me about what difficult pressures you are feeling that leads you to treat them this way, even though you know that they are already doing the best that they can. Yeah, because usually it is indeed pressure that comes somewhere else, or um, either they, they put internal pressure from themselves yep. or they have it from another boss or whatever. And, uh, and for me, indeed, uh, a team leader, a project manager, a coach, whatever, what we should do is shield away the, 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 that pressure from a team. That's that's kind of thing that you need to do, which is kind of the opposite of what most of them are doing in a lot of the cases. Not always, and luckily we have a lot of good people as well, or people that try to do it as much as possible. Um, and it's not a surprise to me that when you show them some more compassion, then quite often you start to notice in the weeks after that that they are not yelling so often. That they are not, uh, that they that they can adopt more of that role of trying to shield the 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 the, the team, as it were, from from those problems, and that they uh, show more trust. And I think that you know, it, isn't it funny that if you show somebody some trust and some compassion, then it will be easier for them to show it in return. And it's, I think it's the same, like you said, you learned it for yourself and because you have more compassion for yourself, you can show it more to others because absolutely the moments that I feel stressed or I feel I might be yeah, shouting to, to my partner or to my children, to, to my team members. And really it has to do with, okay, how much compassion can I feel for myself before yeah, showing it to others? That's, uh, that's, yeah, I like that, that you, you put the links to all these things and we're so much connected, much more that, uh, than we realize Absolutely. sometimes. And that's, uh, that's, uh, so thank you for sharing all that because it's, I think it's really, and it's interesting that you, you talked about how much you work on psychology the last years, but, but, and, and that you had that like years ago as well. So, it, and it feels that this is something I recognize with a lot of people in the agile community is that we seem to get, go over it uh, and sometimes we're more into the psychology then we go back a little bit more technique or something else and then we go back to psychology we seem to to go back and forth on that because we we need it it it's somehow and and in most cases we we come back to okay working a little more on ourselves understanding ourselves a little better than work with the team then realize oh you have this kind of problem i actually think about myself i probably have this as well so i recognize that and i can work again on myself and then go back and that's um that's, i i i I'm, I'm glad that you say that because i i see it in so many others but i don't always realize that that's, that's what we're doing we're we're actually in a cycle and working on ourselves so that's,
Well, so I've, I've also, as part of my, uh, as part of my uh, athletic pursuit, I'm also coaching kids as well. And uh, so they're, you know, age uh, 12 to 18, 19. And I tell them directly that when I'm coaching them, when I'm advising them, when I'm trying to help them, uh, that the advice that I'm giving them, I am giving them this advice almost more for myself to hear it than for them to hear it. That really, a lot of the times, what I'm doing is I'm sharing with them what I'm learning about myself because I see something in them which shows an echo to something I'm experiencing for myself. And when I'm suggesting something to them, when I'm advising them in some way, um, it's really like I'm talking to myself and they happen to be in the room more than I'm talking to them. Um, and the more wow. that I do that, then, the, you know, and I tell them directly, you know, if it sometimes sounds mm -hmm. like I'm a little bit frustrated or if it sounds like I'm being quite insistent, I want you to understand that I'm yelling at myself more than I'm, uh, and, and probably not yelling at you at all. <laughs> and mm -hmm. some of them, the older ones are starting to understand. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's good. Well, that that reminds me of a friend of mine who once said that they, the, she had um, like almost perfect parents in the sense that, um, and um, and it, it turns out that that pre put a lot of stress and pressure on herself because she never saw her parents make mistakes, mm. and and um, we had lots of discussions about that. That in a sense that. Uh, they, they, I'm sure that their par her parents made a lot of mistakes, but she never saw them making the mistakes, and they were not that kind of open, or maybe they were perfect, I don't know. But somehow it put a lot of pressure on, on herself um, for, for not seeing these and, and realizing how hard some of these things can be. Uh, and like you say, when, you, when you're when you very open with these youngsters, then you're open about your own struggles. They, they can understand their own struggles as well and see, okay, Okay, GB is not perfect. Okay, and you can still reach out in this kind of thing. Um, that's also one of the nice things I like about this this series is that uh, people talk openly about the challenges, and a lot of people have already contacted me and said, "Oh, I had no idea that I don't know in this case GB or Lisa Atkins or whatever had this kind of struggles. I have a similar kind of struggles, and it's like it's nice to see somebody who's achieved so much than." also talking about struggles well all of us we have struggles all of us we, we have some things and uh, and it's good to share them and to show like we're still working on that and of course we we you've like you say in the last 10 15 20 years you learned a lot and so the challenges that you have today are not exactly the same or at a deeper level maybe than than the ones right. 10, 15 i understand years them ago. better yes yeah exactly and they and some of might be gone but others might might be there for the next uh, 100 years or however long you, you keep living so that's yeah uh, and, and this is you know this is an important aspect also of the way i teach it's it not everyone likes this style but i'm i i really like um i really like the style of teaching where the 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 demonstrations and the exercises and these things these activities that we do together that I have not perfected them, that I have not been practicing them for 10,000 hours to be able to perform them perfectly. And if I could perform them perfectly, I think they would be less effective. I think it's mm. important. Uh, I want people to see the internal process. The I, yeah, I want them to see the ability to recover from mistakes. I want them to see uh, also the, the willingness to accept your own mistakes. Uh, it, in fact, to me, it's, it's one of the really essential aspects of evolutionary design. I mean, it's, it's useful in a million ways, but specifically thinking about evolutionary design, one of the key points in this is the idea that um, because I can change my mind about design decisions, I don't need to agonize about making the decision at the beginning. I can just do something which is probably good enough, which at least achieves something now, uh, because I know that I have the f not maybe a free option, but I have a less expensive option to change mm -hmm. it in two weeks, in four weeks, in, in three months at any time. 
And I'm not. Tr I'm never trying to make it right. I'm only trying to uh, make it better every day. And this not only takes the pressure away to make decisions, but it means that in a very real way, what we might call mistakes now are no longer mistakes. They don't have the emotional baggage of mistakes. They don't feel like mistakes. They are, just, they are only experiments with outcomes. And it makes it easier for us to recover from those or to adapt from them. We don't have to feel guilt and shame. We don't have to feel regret. We don't have to feel any of these emotions as strongly as we did before because we know that we always, has, always have the option to change our mind. And this, to me, is, is maybe one of the key things that I want programmers to understand about their work. When it comes to the, the hard work of writing code, that uh, it's more important, in my opinion, to build systems that allow you to change your mind than to learn any specific design pattern, any specific testing technique, any specific uh, architecture style. All of these things just become options, just become ideas that you can use in one moment. But maybe the bigger skill involves building systems that allow you to change your mind and building systems that allow you to to change your mind without feeling regret that it's good news uh, about the present and not bad news about the past i, I like that because it, it reminds me of three statements that i've learned from from jürgen this matter friend of mine who said there's three things that people think that customers know exactly what they want Developers know exactly how to, to do, to write that piece of code and that the world never change. And of course, these three are completely false. Yeah. No, no customer know exactly what they want until they see something and they say, this is not what I want. And then you can, can build an, a better version of what they want because either they don't want it, they don't know what they want or they cannot express it. Developers, like you say, we are still trying to figure out. And yes, we can spend an awful lot of time creating something the best that we can, but it's never good enough. And it's usually much better to just create the first version and that is easy to adapt. And of course, we all know that the world is changing all the time. So there's no way that you can create something that is ready for eternity. Right. Even the best program that you wrote five years ago, even if you never made any mistake and it was perfect, five years ago, it's, it's completely redundant. The world has changed a lot. And, and so the chances that nothing has changed or needs to change for that perfect piece of software is just impossible. So that's... Um, and that feeling of regret is the, is the key element that's really changed for me in the last five years. I mean, I've always been aware of this, uh, this cliche that the world is changing all the time and that even if mm. you do everything perfectly, because the conditions will change, therefore your perfect work was perfect last year, but it's not as useful this year. I think that understanding that up here is one thing, but when you can experience that and don't feel regret, when you feel, when you, when that doesn't feel like a mistake, but it just feels like this is normal and this is how everything works and it's okay. Not just that it's unavoidable, but that it's not a problem to solve. It's a reality to accept. And I think that's one of the really big things that has changed for me in the last five years is being much more open to this kind of attitude, that this is not only tolerable, but it is to be accepted. It's the only way it could be. Yeah, it's, and I think that people who are in that mindset and understand that mindset, and I think a lot of agilists have that, made it also a lot easier for a lot of people to accept what's happening in the COVID world because with it was completely unpredictable. There was unpredictable what, what versions or what, I don't know, uh, different kind of versions of COVID existed, how 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 little that we knew. And, and I saw some people around me that said, okay, we need better thinking and we, why do these scientists make mistakes? Well, no, they, they just made one version and they already know by the time that they talk to you 
that there is uh, another reality out there, but they just keep improving. And I see, well, what I've noticed that the agilists around me were much more able to deal with that changing situation than some of these people that were focusing. We want to know, and why do they know? Well, that's that's the reality. It's um, yeah, and we've seen I, that. I think the fi the last two three years, we've seen that how hard that is for so many people. Yes, I think that's the if if one. It's hard to say it this way, but I'll say it this way at the risk of making people angry. If there's one good thing which has come out of this uh, pandemic and the resulting social changes, it it has been a good reality check for those of us who identify as systems thinkers that um, we have been surrounding ourselves with other systems thinkers and probably we have fooled ourselves and each other into believing that uh, because we are talking all the time with such sophisticated and experienced and uh, and uh, what's the word I'm looking for adapted systems thinkers, people who have been thinking this way for many years, who have become comfortable with thinking this way, who have for whom these ideas are no longer shocking, are no longer surprising. Mm -hmm. Um, we've just had years and years to become comfortable with a lot of these ideas in a way that most of the world's population has never had the chance. It's shocking to them mm -hmm. now. They are becoming, they are struggling to understand these feedback loops that, uh, that, that govern the way the world works and govern the, the, that affect their thinking. And of course, it becomes easy to think about conspiracies, or of course, it becomes easy to think about, to try to make the model simplistic because it's more comfortable. Of course, it's easier to do all these things. Some of us systems thinkers have needed the reminder that it's not such an easy thing that we're doing. It's not such an mm -hmm. easy way to think. It's not such a comfortable way to think. But we have a 10 years head start, a 20 years head start on some other people. And then when they struggle to understand, we need to remember what it was like the first time we read Donella Meadows, the first time that we read uh, Jerry Weinberg, the first time that we, we read Peter Senge, the first time that we read any of these books. And these ideas were fresh and complicated and difficult and strange. And it took us some years to really become comfortable with them. And now, 95% of the world's population is having this experience now. And it wasn't their choice. They didn't do it because they were interested. They did it because the world became so complex that it became necessary for them to confront these realities. And I think that we can have much more compassion for them and blame them less for having difficulty understanding. Of course, we would like it if they understood more quickly. Of course, we would like it if they would welcome these thoughts and so not fight out against them so much but uh, i think that uh, i have noticed both a lot of frustration in our social circles but also a surprising amount of compassion for just how difficult it is for everyone else who are suddenly thinking about this complexity thinking for the first time and don't have the chance to read 10 books on the topic and don't have the chance to go to conferences and to discuss it over beer in the bar with people who are trying to help them understand. It's, it then, must be incredibly difficult for them. And like you say, it took you 20 years or it took us 20 years to understand some of these things and we're still struggling and we're still learning and they had to do it in like one week because basically yeah. that's what, what yeah. happened there. And that's, uh, I thank you for bringing that up because I've seen the, the part that a lot of us had it easier, but I, I didn't think hard enough about how the, the hard part it is for all these others to struggle and learn it and, and to catch up 20 years of, of learning yeah. into, into a few months. Our that's, brains that's did not really... evolve to think about these things. No. We have to train ourselves. Uh, we have to train each other. We have to help each other. That's uh, that's really powerful. I thank you very much for sharing that. That's um, that's really helpful. I think. I hope. Well, like you say, it could make people angry, but I hope it it helps people because that's that's the kind of thing that we need to do. We need to have compassion for each other, and we need to understand why people are struggling with some of these things. Mm -hmm. So that's um, and not just well why 
we, we kind of know because they don't understand it, but there is also a deeper why. Why didn't they understand it? Well, because they didn't have the time to um, to adjust to these kind of new realities and they didn't need to learn it in, in other kind right. of things. And they don't have the time because that's that's the other part is that the world is changing so fast and, and some people are understanding and then the others are not and then it creates a clash between both of these things. So very interesting to share that, thank you. I want to go to um, another part that um, what drives you and I, I think when every time we and it's same same here I feel a lot of passion a lot of like I said you you have a lot to share and you want to share do you know where that drive or that passion is coming from um, no not really I think it has always been there this is one of those things that again as I've been uh, as I've been understanding myself and my own emotions and psyche, um, I am the 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 simplicity of the answer just becomes even stronger and stronger. That really the answer is I don't know where it comes from, but I notice that I am finding it easier to connect directly with it uh, in a way mm. that wasn't so easy for me to do ten years ago, twenty years ago. That you know, like I said earlier, I had, I apparently had some, you know, genetic advantages and some luck about um, my, if you want to say it, my educational or my cognitive development very early in life. I was a really, really smart kid. I found it very easy to learn things, which means that I learned a lot of things in the first, you know, um, eight, ten years of my life. And already at a very young age, I wanted to, I wanted to teach people because I, it seemed to me like they were making simple mistakes and I could help them. Now, what I didn't mm -hmm. understand at the time is that most people don't like being told that they're stupid. Most people don't like being told that they make mistakes. And, and it's very easy at that age not to understand why other people are yelling at you, not to understand why other people don't want to be your friend, not to understand why you're making them angry when you're only trying to help them. And I think that what that did is that, that I, I spent after that probably 25 years training myself to not help people. I know that sounds maybe strange mm. for you to hear me say it, but... Uh, you know, I, because I, when you I, when you tried to help them, you were kind of do I understand correctly? You were pushing your ideas, and you didn't have much empathy for them, and so you kind of, yeah, yeah, uh, you you tried to help them, but they didn't feel helped. Or they, exactly, they, that's that that's the perfect way to say it. I was I was genuinely trying to help them, and they did not feel helped, mm. and then this created this you know this feedback loop of. Uh, me blaming them for being lazy or me blaming them for not having enough gratitude or me blaming them for failing to understand what I was trying to do and mm. me becoming increasingly frustrated with them, which only made the relationship worse. And so then I went so through this. Why period. would you want to help people that didn't want to be helped? And so right. then, yeah, okay. So then I would spend a lot of time, um, you know, hoping that somebody else would give me a, a clear, specific authority to teach others. So this is what would happen in school, or this is what would happen in the early days of my career, where some teacher or some manager or someone would make it very clear uh, to put me in a position of some kind of uh, authority that w where it's expected that I'm trying to teach people, where it's expected that I'm trying to show yeah, them as a things. tutor or as a trainer exactly or as a trainer yeah. as a helper yeah, yeah yeah it became very natural and i think that but in the rest of times you know it became i had to spend a lot of energy trying to understand when it was okay for me to share what i knew when it was socially acceptable when it would be received well when would people feel like they are being helped and it was a lot of trial and error, a lot of uh, a lot of error. I would say maybe much more error than I would have liked. Um, and the rest of the world as well, I assume. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, we are, we, it, it's a good reminder that we really are all only making it up as we go along and that we don't really understand anything um, mm. about how to live with each other and how to treat each other, blah, blah, blah. Everyone has to learn the same lessons uh, over and over. Um, you know, when I was when I was learning mathematics at the age of seven, I wasn't learning how to be the 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 nice kid on the playground at seven that was the the exchange mm -hmm. that the universe made for me um and so i spent a lot of time struggling with understanding the context failing to understand the context and making a lot of mistakes blaming people a lot this is where i think a lot of where that judgmental attitude came from and then finally i think in the last 10 years, as I have become, you know, this is this is not decoration. There is some wisdom which comes with the, all these gray hairs. Mm -hmm. I have understood that a lot more. I have experienced a lot more. I've been working to try to understand what's going on in the minds of other people and to feel compassion for it. And it's now like the pendulum has swung all the way back in the other direction. And I can go back to what it was like when I was seven years old and I knew something that you don't know, and I want to share it with you for the pure joy of helping you to understand, because I think it will make your life better. And mm. that's really been the, the, what drives me now, I think, to continue to do these things, to continue to teach, to continue to coach, to continue to act as a mentor, all these things, is that I now have a much clearer uh, idea in my mind, much better understanding of how to help people to feel helped. And what that allows me to do is to give the things that I know, give the experience that I have, the wisdom that I've accumulated, uh, and to be more open about what I don't know uh, in a way that I can now give that to people with much less fear. I can give it to them with the pure, as Marshall Rosenberg used to say, you know, the, with the pure joy of an eight-year-old just for the sake of giving it to people. And but but do, do I hear also that your seven, eight-year-old um, had a hard time saying, I don't know this, and had a hard time saying the things you didn't know? Or did I hear something? Uh, like that? That's a good question. I hadn't thought about it. I would say probably yes, but he didn't realize it because he knew so much compared to the others. So then when he, yeah, when he didn't know something, when they knew something that he didn't, I'm sure that that little kid felt a lot of guilt and a lot of shame mm -hmm. because already he was building an identity focused around being expert. And expert this is something being the smart kid, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's another thing that has, especially in the last few years, and I need to, uh, acknowledge uh, at least one person out there, John Turley, who has really helped me to connect with this in a way that uh, I wasn't able to do before, to help me understand how I had uh, how I had put too much of my not too much, but how much of my identity came from uh, the, 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 the the feeling of being the expert, and that that isn't that. I can do more for people than only be the expert. And I actually did spend a few years trying to get away from being the expert. Um, and I think that was a mistake. I think now part of what I've been able to do is to allow the expert part of me to be himself while also combining that with more compassion, less blame, more welcoming, and less um, less shame about sharing what we know and sharing what we don't know and just giving that to each other because it helps each of us can help each other's lives be better i think that in a way that's really what drives me now is this much more pure connection with giving what i know to people for the pure joy of giving it to them and being more open for them to give to me what they know for the pure joy of giving it to me. And that and, we can do it together in a way that maybe I wasn't as open to do 10 years ago. 
and in that sense you build become be both the, a bigger expert in in because right. basically you you learn from each other in, in a sense that's uh, that's really nice that's yeah uh, that's nice to share this um yeah i've recognized this the struggles myself as a consultant as a coach as well that sometimes yeah you want to to push information that you you know and and it's it's interesting it, well it's no not interesting what's the word it's frustrating when people are not interested in in that information um and I, i've learned that uh, for me what works for me best is to pull away and say okay i know i can be well there's always a chance that you give too much or you you don't give enough and i've decided some years ago that i would uh, pull back and and uh, prefer to not give enough but put the re responsibility on the people to ask for more because it's much harder for people to push back especially when you're an expert and you, if you're if you're hired as an expert uh it's harder for people to push back and they might feel frustrated and and i i actually might um on uh without knowing um keep people down because they don't learn on their own because i want to push 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 and so i decided i think five or ten years ago to say okay let's not give anything and but I, what i've learned over the time and what i didn't do in the beginning was i need to tell people if i don't give you enough you, you can come to me and that's something i've learned in beginning years when i pulled back i didn't tell people you can come back to me and i put the responsibility for your learning on yourself and when you're ready to learn more or when you yeah come and and, and come here and that's something I've learned over over the years. That uh, that was hard for me uh, to 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 find that balance, basically. Yeah. That's, yes, that's and that's. I even had an incident earlier this year with a client where that went really badly, uh, where they somehow had a different picture than the picture in my mind about exactly what you're describing now. This sort of balance of. Uh, me not trying to provide all the answers, but to give you an opportunity to, you know, uh, speak up about what it is that you need from me and to feel comfortable mm -hmm. and invited, especially not just comfortable, but invited to ask me to speak up for what you need. Exactly. And I had a, a really bad experience with one client where it just, it was a disaster. It just, they had the picture in their mind that I was telling them to shut up. I don't know how it happened. Um, and sometimes it goes like that. And I think that, um, it's a good reminder. It was painful in the moment, and it's still painful a little bit now when I think about it. But it serves as a useful reminder that mm. this is always a negotiation, that it's not so clear, and that you don't know what kinds of experiences that person has had in their childhood, in their adult life, that makes them different degrees of comfortable in speaking up for what they need. And mm. while on the one hand, it's not so helpful to feed them with a spoon and give them every piece of information, or worse, to turn on the fire hose and to soak them with all your information and then <laughs> exactly. expect that they learn it all. Um, at the same time, it, it's not enough to just ask them questions and to expect them to pull everything on their own, that this is a negotiation. And mm -hmm. the negotiation seems to proceed more effectively when that negotiation is open compared to when we allow it to happen only under the surface. It maybe doesn't yeah. feel so comfortable in the beginning of a relationship to be so open about this. Maybe it feels like it's awkward or mechanical or, or somehow just not the kind of thing that we talk about. But when we make this negotiation more open, at least it's easier to deal with the problems when they arise. Um, and maybe it's a painful way to learn the lesson, but it was a helpful way to learn the lesson. I will remember it better uh, in my upcoming work than maybe I did two years ago. Yeah, well, it, it, it's, it's, I've learned it for similar painful uh, things. And I've learned indeed that I, uh, when I start to coach a person, I have to tell them basically in, in the first first conversation and then the probably the next 10 conversations, look, I want you to, and, and I, of course I need to help them to keep inviting them, not expecting that they yes. will call me after that first conversation. I need to 
keep inviting them and then tell them and when they say well i'm frustrated because i, I don't have enough access to you to say well that's exactly what i was talking about in that first conversation so i want you to to invite and i want to come back and it's 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 like you say we need to be very open very explicit about it because if we don't especially the people that need it most they won't come to us for whatever reason that happened in their past or somehow in the relationship because somehow it, it starts in the beginning as well sometimes because because their manager told them that uh, yeah the, she, she told them that you need to come and that they might feel whatever and and yeah just having that conversation like you say it it, it is a hard conversation so thank you for bringing that up because it's indeed yeah that's that's it's it's probably the hardest part of, of starting a coaching conversation and coaching helping people but the better we do this in the in the first few conversations the better the more they will learn from us and we from them because it's like you say it's a two-way street it's uh, we always learn from each other and these these Thank kinds you. of techniques have kind of become the new intellectual curiosity for me in a way where perhaps mm understanding technology or or even understanding the craft of of how to do design or refactoring these kinds of things those were intellectual uh, puzzles exercises challenges which were very very interesting to me 15 and 20 years ago and now i i i'm surprised to notice that i'm although i am frustrated with it i am also genuinely curious about what is it that I can do to help people feel more comfortable in these ways? Uh, what really is the most important part of our relationship? What is the bottleneck? What really is the thing that I need to focus on that allows um, real communication to flow between us? Not just about mm. features, not just about design, but, you know, what makes it so that you feel more welcome to talk to me? What makes it so that I feel more welcome to talk to you? That keeps the communication channel open better. Which ways of communicating seem to not just cause you to understand me better, but cause you to feel better about interacting with me, that cause you to feel worse about interacting with me? Um, it can be overwhelming at times, but it's never boring. <laughs> yes that's 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 the right word it's it's never boring we keep learning and and like you say it's it's work that we have to do on our, on our side but it helps actually our customers or the people that we work with the people around it and well not just the customers i would see it it helps also in my family to talk about these yes. kind of things um as, even if my my partner would say don't you don't need to coach me and all these kind of things well the more i understand myself the better <laughs> it helps and all the things and there still is a lot of work like in all these kind of things the way i the way i hear it is i am not your client and my reply to that is usually well then stop acting like one <laughs> <laughs> but that's part of it i mean this isn't just about our client relationships this is really about our relations with all the people in our lives and it just so happens exactly. that I think that instead of treating uh, our family more like our clients, I think what happens is that we're just recognizing that our clients, our coworkers, uh, I don't want to say they're like family, but we're just treating them like regular people. We're treating them like people because they are. Uh, you know, this was one of the things that really I enjoyed very much and I miss about, um, you know, about our uh, mutual friend Jerry Weinberg was uh, about mm -hmm. um, software as a human activity. I mean, just even the first three letters of shape was enough to remind us that we're people first and we are software professionals second. Yes, exactly. And that's, um, and it, it always comes back to that. And yeah, it's, it's also in the Agile Manifesto, it's people and interactions and these this kind of things. It's It was for me very much a big part of the extreme programming. And um, well, I, I've just put live, well, just a few weeks ago, I put live the video with um ah, damn it, like, uh, with, with Jipa, and and he said that for him uh xp was so powerful because of the community and much more yeah. than anything else it's about the community and that that sounded very yeah I, that resonated a lot with me it's indeed about the people it's indeed about our interactions at what we learned and like you say we 
yeah, we have to treat the, our customers and everybody around as persons, and and then we, we see uh, what well, we learn, and we can we can go and, and step uh, together further in this world, and, and to learn together, in a sense. Thank you for sharing because that's indeed we're we've been to in multiple ways into that conversation, but really deep, I think. So that's uh, that's very interesting. I want to go to, and I kind of, we already talked a little bit about some of the things that you achieved and learning on yourself, but what do you consider your biggest achievement? What are you really proud of? Um, I am so much less an asshole now than I was 10 years ago. I don't think there's anything uh, I've been able to achieve in my life that has been any more important than that. I think that uh, I, I, you know, I'm still plenty an asshole, but uh, but no, seriously. I mean, it, it. I had a realization about 15 years ago that I really was not happy with the way I was treating other people, and mm -hmm. um, and I just. It, it it really is strange to to think of it this way, but I really did wake up one morning. I, I, I don't even remember what the incident was, but I'm sure there was some incident where I just walked away and I just felt really horrible about how it, it ended. And I just finally had to say to myself, you know, this is enough. You can't keep doing this. This is, this is not... If you keep going like this, you're going to end up alone. You're going to end up at the end of your life alone. Nobody's going to want to be with you and nobody's going to care. And... I, you know, I think I finally just became aware of my own responsibility for how I was acting with people and I decided I was going to change it. And it, it started with something as stupid as um, you might even remember me writing about this at the time because it's, it's around the same time when I was talking a lot about the personal finance stuff and I wrote about E-Prime which is this way of uh, speaking English where you don't use the verb to be. And mm, the yes, I remember. That was a very popular blog post that you wrote. That yeah, time. exactly. I, from like 2006 or some, some time around that period. Mm -hmm. And the basic idea, is, the, the theory behind it is that when we, when we talk about, when we use the verb to be, we spend a lot of time labeling. We label things, we label people, um, and it becomes very easy to express our judgments about things. And then, you know, if you express your judgments about things more often, then you will believe your own judgments about things and you won't think about them critically. You won't criticize them as much. You won't rethink them as much. You become more closed-minded. You, 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 um, you accept your own beliefs and it becomes harder to evaluate them and change them. They become deeper. They become more like habits. And I, and I, so I guessed, well, maybe this is what's happening to me. Maybe what I have been doing now for the first 30 years of my life is just gradually convincing myself that my judgments about other people are obvious and correct, even though they don't seem to be helpful even though they mm. seem to be making my relationships with people worse, not better. Um, and that they were, they were both obstructing my professional effectiveness and they were interfering with my relationships with the people in my life outside of the professional view, in just my personal life. And really, I just one morning kind of decided I'm going to try this. I'm going to try to do this for a while and see if I notice a difference. And within a few months, I did. I genuinely started to notice a shift in how I was thinking, a shift in how I was viewing other people, a shift in how I was treating other people. And it was like that was the, the opening change. And then from there, I became genuinely more interested in how to improve my relationships with other people. And I read more things and I tried more things. And, you know, it took 10 years to really make a big improvement in my relationships with people, but it was undeniable. 
And of course, there's still more to do. Um, but I can honestly say with confidence that if I compare me now and me 15 years ago, I am fundamentally a much better person now, a much kinder person, a much more compassionate person, a much more enjoyable person to be with, uh, an easier person to love, and a more loving person than I was 15 years ago. And I, and of course, that's had huge impacts on the rest of my life, in the, my professional life, in my personal life. Um, I enjoy my own existence much more than I did 15 years ago. I feel better about everything. It's not perfect. Uh, the work isn't done. But uh, anything else which maybe I have achieved in that period of time, or all the things that I achieved before, the academic achievements or professional achievements, blah, blah, blah. Yes, those were nice. Yes, I'm proud of many of them. But this is the one thing that matters more to me than anything else. It's the one thing that feels the most significant, that has had the greatest impact, and that just feels the best of anything that I have achieved or maybe anything that I will achieve again. And if I can find ways to be an even better person, if I can say the same answer to this question 10 years from now about today, that would be even better. Wow, that's that's really profound. It, there's lots of ideas and lots of things. First, it, it reminds me of one of the statements that Jeff Bezos once told that he his what was it his grandfather or something still told him after he, he made a very bad remark about his grandmother or something like that and then he received yeah it's it's much harder to be kind than it's to be to be smart because mm. he, he made some some really nasty remark which was correct probably but like you say it didn't matter um and yeah it, it, it doesn't doesn't help you to be correct at, at some of these things if you if you're just being an asshole that that doesn't help what i find interesting is that you say this um and well, let, let, let's put it like this. Canadians are really uh, known in the world as being kind and really like it. And, and the interesting part, I've been uh, editing yesterday, so it's a Monday, I've been editing uh, yesterday um, a video about Michael Sahota, who said something similar. It's not the exact same thing, but he said something similar where he worked really hard. And so both, both of you are Canadian. So basically, you both of you say something like, I had so much anger or so much things that I was pulling out into the world and actually it's it's work that I needed to do and um, so it, it's it's interesting to see that and what I hear heard him say and I hear you say something similar is that actually this is also much easier because you can work on yourself and you cannot really change well even if it's true whatever you say about that other person it doesn't change it yeah it, you can right. be mad at that person for not changing this his or her behavior but you can change your behavior and you can yes. change being nicer and what you added to this is that because of that you you your world has become better as well you have become better but also the whole environment everything around you so your life became better that's what i'm hearing absolutely uh, by by just changing yourself and and being nicer to people your life itself became better so that's uh, an interesting thing to see i'm not surprised but it, it is hard to do that of course yes like and, I, and i want to clarify something canadians are known worldwide for being polite and apologetic we could mm -hmm. be a hell of a lot kinder and unfortunately there are you know there are let's say there are parts of this country which are much more genuinely friendly and kind than others and i don't want to say anything mm -hmm. about anyone in particular i sometimes feel like canadians have a, a a national identity of uh let's call it um self-righteousness especially mm -hmm. because we compare ourselves to some people who live not very far from us <laughs> and we feel a kind of moral superiority um but, you know, I, it, I think that uh, we have at least mastered the fine art of faking kindness. And a surprising number of us have managed to really internalize that kindness and be genuinely kind. And for the rest of us, we're doing an excellent job of fooling the rest of the world. I mm. think 
I think our national identity could benefit with a little bit less politeness and a little bit more kindness. Mm, that's a nice way of putting it. And actually, well, when you talk about your, your close by neighbors, that's actually how a lot of people from Europe sometimes feel when we go to the US, that there is always smile and always, but it's, it's sometimes a lot of fakeness. And, yes. and basically you say something similar like, okay, we're really polite and we, we always say sorry, but we might not feel always kind and, and think kind. So that's, uh, that's really I, I, nice uh, thinking about it. A lot, of, uh, a lot of our travels have been around Northern Europe and it's a lot of the, the societies that I look up to. Uh, and I feel more comfortable there than I do sometimes in my, in my own uh, you know, where I live here, precisely because they are a little less polite, uh, but more genuinely kind. When, when they want to help you, they really want to help you. Uh, there's very little fake politeness. There's very little coerced kindness. When they are kind to you, it really comes more, it feels more genuine. It seems more genuine. It comes more directly from the heart. And I, I, I think that's one thing that has really changed for me in in this period where I've been uh, very introspective is that it seems so self-indulgent to say it, but it's, it's true. I, I genuinely care about you people a hell of a lot more than I did 20 years ago. And I can feel mm. it. Mm. It's uh, well, uh, uh, you, you bring up something really important that I thought about asking earlier on and then completely forgot. But I wanted to ask is the fact that you've been traveling and you're moving to so many countries, did it affect a lot of the thing? And that's what you kind of saying is that you learned so much basically also about yourself by meeting other people and about seeing other countries because you talked about how people are different and, and you talked earlier on and that, well, if you go to other countries, we have all kind of different cultures, different ideas. Did, did, did that help you in, in your whole journey? Let's put it like this. Absolutely. And, and I, it's funny because I, you know, I, we're going to indulge in some national stereotypes now. So please, everyone, yeah, don't, that, don't, <laughs> don't send, don't send me any emails. Um, the, I, it was hard in the beginning and especially I spent, you know, when I spent some time uh, working in Northern European cultures where directness was a little bit easier to find. I'm sure you and I can both guess about one country mm -hmm. in particular, not very far from you that we can, uh, that we can mm -hmm. point to that was a source of this. Um, and it was shocking in the beginning um, and it felt wrong and it didn't take much time for me to, um, as I spent more time with people uh, from all around, you know, from everywhere from, you know, uh, the Netherlands and Belgium through Scandinavia, um, that really experiencing a bit more directness, um, I think was a wake up call for me. I think it was something that um, helped me understand a little bit some of the um, performative politeness that I had grown up with, uh, you know, in my time growing up in fairly typical parts of Canada, where even there wasn't that much of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I started, I think that I got to experience a lot more uh, genuine, authentic emotion as a result of a lot of that travel and as a result of working with people who grew up in those cultures. Uh, in both directions, genuine, what we would call genuine positive emotion and genuine negative emotion. Uh, when they don't, when they don't like you, you can be sure that they don't like you. And when they like you, you can be sure that they like you uh, mm -hmm. because they will tell you. And that was something that, um, again, was a bit of a shock in the beginning, but something that I really grew to respect over time. And I have been trying to import a little of that back into my own home cultures. I like to joke that one of my personal missions as a, as a, a, a mentor, as a trainer, especially when I'm working with programmers and when they make a mistake and then they apologize, you know, someone will be typing and then they'll just, they'll make a typo or something, or they'll, they'll run the test and it should have passed, but it fails and they'll apologize. 
And I'll just say, no, 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 not I'm sorry, just oops. Oops is enough. You don't need to mm. apologize. There's no, there's, no, there's no shame in making a mistake. We write tests so that making a mistake doesn't have to be anything more than oops. You just say oops, you delete it, you write this correct code, the test passes, and everyone's happy. And there's no need to apologize for any of that. If I could import some of that back into my home culture, I would, uh, I would feel happier. Mm, it's it's interesting because indeed, yeah. When when I talked about and like you say, it's it's of course the typical Canadian. If there is, it's as much true as it is not true. But the typical thing that we know or that we say about Canadians is that you always apologize and you even yes. apologize for apologizing and and things like yeah. that. So that's that's the kind of thing. Um, but so yeah, it's it's interesting and like you you said, of course. There, uh, we can look at cultures in many different ways and sometimes they don't help us and sometimes they do help us. But traveling around and learning about these different ones, this is for me where the interesting part is. You Absolutely. learn about the differences and you, you, and in most cases, I learn a lot more about myself than it's about them. It's just looking yeah. at the world in a different way and that, uh, that tells yeah. us a lot. And, and it must be said, I mean, a lot of the travel that, that my wife and I have done over the last 10 years has been in relatively similar cultures to our own, you know? It's, we haven't spent time in Southeast Asia. We haven't spent uh, time in Africa. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still been around a lot of cultures that are pretty similar to our own. And even there, there's enough interesting variation that it's easy to learn things, that it's easy to see differences, that it's easy to um, to be open to different ways of thinking, even just going from Northern Europe to Southern Europe or going a little bit farther east or a little bit farther west. Um, I think that, uh, uh, I, I think I just, it's been just coincidence that we haven't really ventured further, um, but, I'm genuinely surprised at how much variation we've been able to see and how much we've learned from other people, even while sticking with people whose cultural histories are pretty similar to ours. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring that up because indeed we, we sometimes think, oh, Europe, we're all the same and we're or Western culture. There is already a lot. And yeah, there's a lot of difference there. And that brings us back to that earlier conversation that you learned so much about people that are so much different um and i it, it reminds me of well, let's i wouldn't want to go to completely into that but a lot of people think when i meet people face to face we we can read body language and i learned over the last years how much that is just wrong because so much of our, our culture makes us behave and we think that we understand you're yeah. you're nodding and that actually feels like okay we're agreeing and in other cultures that might be different and and it, it gives us exactly yeah that's the kind of thing it's like yeah we, we're so much used and like you say the cultures or the countries that you visited and that i visited in most th things are very similar and yet we learn so much about ourselves yeah. that's that's yeah that's uh yeah very powerful to share um and we we should all i, I think we should all learn to travel much more visit countries with other i know that you learn you you make the habit also learning languages because yes. yeah, i think you 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 do a lot of that and there is a lot to learn there i've been i've been on duolingo a lot the last uh, months trying to learn ukraine language just you know, as kind of way to support and if I, to understand culture a little bit and there's there's much that we can learn from these kind of things absolutely yes Okay, I want to go to the next one, and we—I okay. think we already talked a lot about it. About um, mm. because for me, uh, a lot of agilists, we all have kind of ways of, of behaving, and you already talked about technical stuff and other things. But do you have a personal agility tip to share? Is this something that you say? This is something that I want to share with the rest of the world. Um, yeah, there, there, are, uh, there are certainly a few. I think that um, one that really stands out as being helpful, um, and that is a part, I think is it sort of a, let's say a generically agile thing, mm -hmm. actually comes from, uh, comes from real options theory. And uh, the simplest way to think of it is that when you don't know what to do, uh, 
do something which creates more options. That this is one very right. simple little trick. When you don't know what to do, if you're in a situation where either you have to choose among a bunch of, of directions to go, or you have to invent some path and you can't see a clear path to go, choose something that allows you the most options. So if you don't know what the good decision is, make the decision which gives you the most options or make the decision which is the easiest to undo, which is a, a mm. specific kind of option. And that uh, one of the things that that leads us to do, if we adopt this philosophy, um, you know, of course, this is very much, we've all heard about um, uh, the values of uh, deferring commitment, because if you commit later, then you'll have more information with which to make a better decision later on. Um, maybe some recent uh, information in, in uh, behavioral economics maybe makes us question whether this strategy is truly useful, but let's imagine for a moment that it is, um, that uh, we don't just, we don't only change the decisions that we make, but if we practice this long enough, we notice that it's helpful to build systems that allow us to change our mind. That it when, that when you say real options, I just want to bring it in. Yeah. You're talking about the techniques that are coming from Chris Maltz and Olaf Mason. Eh? That's for example, that's yes, yes. Yeah. I, I I mention them not because they own the idea of having options, but more because that gives people out there, uh, um, you know, a convenient uh, search term for your favorite search engine to go and read some more about it. I mean, ultimately. We start in the, in the beginning, we start by focusing our energy on having more options. That generally speaking, if we have more options, then we can wait longer to make a decision. We can make a decision with more information. Our decisions will fit the moment better. That's the sort of layer one of the theory. But what really happens underneath, the, for me, the real power happens when, when this is a habit then it means that you will intentionally build systems that make it less expensive to change your mind. And then an ironic thing happens. If changing your mind is less expensive, then you don't have to worry so much about making the right decision early on, which means, for example, you it's take less quicker decisions, right? You can make decisions which are you can do more of what behavior, uh, behavioral economic, uh, economists call satisficing, right? This idea of making a decision which is good enough for the moment rather than trying to maximize the value of every decision. You know, one of the, mm. uh, you know, one of the, the, the things that I've, one of my life philosophies is sort of maximizing is a Western disease that we spend, a, a, we waste a lot of our energy trying to maximize the value of decisions. And I think that when you begin to trust the value which comes from deferring commitment which comes from having options mm -hmm. then uh, the second stage of benefit really starts to kick in and you start to recognize the value of satisficing instead of trying to maximize value from every decision and this helps you i mean part of being an agilist part of being agile if you want to say it that way i don't like to anymore but it's a convenient shorthand um, is to have a bias towards action, is to have a bias towards experiments and getting feedback. Instead of sitting in the corner uh, carefully for six months thinking before you choose an action, but having more of a bias towards action and getting feedback and learning from it. Um, when we practice, when we build the habit of building options, of gathering options, we don't only do that, but we also build a system. We build a habit of building systems that allow us to change our minds, and then we don't have to fear every decision. Mm -hmm. We can make decisions a bit more quickly. We can take a little bit more risk because we have ways of managing those risks. And and in a sense, that's all, for me a lot what XP did in the beginning by doing TDD and and the safety net and everything Absolutely. that's around there. That that's a lot. And yeah, it's 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 a technical way, but actually what you're saying is it's it's actually a full mindset and a full way of, of yeah, 
thinking about options and and basically yeah creating a way to change your mind and i've noticed right. it indeed like you say is that the easier it is to change your mind and and the, the more you want actually the, the 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 kind of strange way with real options is that you create a system that it makes it possible uh, to make a decision as late as possible but because you all set that up you can actually take much quicker decisions and then change it I, yes. I remember Chris Matz talking about, okay, the moment I know that the Agile conference is happening and it's going in that, uh, I don't know, it's in Houston or it's in Toronto, I can just book a plane, I can oh, yeah. book a hotel without yeah. knowing if I want to go, but exactly. I just take that decision and then I just need to know at what time will I can I change that decision. Oh, in the months before, I can just cancel my hotel. Exactly. That gives you a lot more options, it's much cheaper and everything happens there so and that really um, is the perfect example i mean when 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 i have the idea that i want to go somewhere step one is to book the hotel i don't even know which hotel step one is to book any hotel step two is to put an item in todoist that says cancel this reservation with a due date mm -hmm. um, and then after that i will then turn to sarah and say hey uh, I just got an invitation to go to some conference in this city. Do you think you want to go? Mm. And that ends up actually being, uh, now I don't literally always do it that way, but I know that if Sarah is busy doing something and she will be free in 10 minutes, there's something that I can do in those 10 minutes that will be a step in the right direction. And that way of thinking is very freeing to me. I feel very liberated by knowing that I can take actions and get them out of my head. What's really amazing to me is that after I take those first two steps, I know that seven months from now, I will get a reminder that I have booked this hotel in Bratislava and I look at that reminder and I say, oh shit, that's right, I guess I'm not going. And it takes me three minutes to go cancel that reservation. And in the seven months, I didn't think about it. I didn't waste mm -hmm. a single bit of brain energy on wondering if I'm going, worrying about preparing, worrying about getting the perfect price for the hotel, worrying about which hotel is going to be the closest to the conference venue, blah, blah, blah. I can figure all that stuff out later when I need to. But for now, I have a default plan. It's good enough and I can just do it only because that is a free option. And recognizing once you start looking for where are your free options in life, then there's this wonderful thing that the human mind does where it starts to look for free options everywhere and then you notice them everywhere. And you can start to see other examples of where you have free options and you start looking for free options. And the more of them there have that you have, generally speaking, the better it is the easier it's, the less of your life is it, it, it's wonderful that you say it this way because it, it, it's one of the things well i have one one um kid in, in university and we don't know if he will have uh, to repass exams in the summer and it's interesting that i didn't even think about we, we have been had a lot of discussions will we go on holiday where are we and actually i, I didn't even think that we could just book something and and we'll cancel it if it's closer to the to the moment uh, and I've been using this example for a long time and I didn't think about it and you were just explaining the thing in Bratislava and it's like, oh, wait a minute, we can actually do something similar and then, yeah, like you say, it's a free option and we can just cancel it later on yes. and that, that gives us much more options and we can actually, there's two or three weeks that are our options that we can just book them all and then cancel it uh, once we're closer yeah. to, to these kind of things. And there isn't, there isn't only a practical value to this, but I think there is, there is significant emotional value in this way of thinking. I think that um, the average person overestimates the commitment they are making with every decision. And this has some bad effects. This has some bad mm -hmm. effects in the way we work, and this has some bad effects in the way we treat people. And I think that... Um, if we spend some time practicing changing our minds, then we feel much less emotional resistance 
in those moments when we really do need to change our mind. And when we need to change our mind about something which is emotionally expensive, emotionally difficult, uh, emotionally uncertain, um, where perhaps it's not going to be very nice, the outcome of changing our mind, or we're going to feel guilt or shame about changing our mind. It's, it seems strange to, to say, but I think it's true that if we practice canceling hotel reservations and canceling flight reservations and canceling dinner out with our friends and, I, you know, those kinds of things, this prepares us to be able to make those more difficult emotional decisions, not because I want us to become unfeeling and just, ah, I'm going to mm. cancel on even it's his problem. But if we can feel, if we can feel an amount of regret which is more appropriate to the situation, I think that probably makes our life better. Maybe uh, zero I, regret is a bad idea, but I don't want us to feel ten kilograms of regret when two kilograms of regret is enough. It, it reminds me a lot about open space and and the fact that the um, uh, use your feet to to walk yeah. out of uh, sessions and stuff like that. Ever since I've been going to open space conferences. When I now go to another kind of conference and I'm in a session and I don't get anything out of it or I cannot add anything, I just walk out and I don't feel any regret. I have actually the last, I don't know, five years, I do the same thing in meetings. If I feel that I cannot bring any value, I won't go to a meeting. And of yep. course, there is always, there are reasons to go to a meeting, even if you won't get anything out for whatever political reason, but that still means that there is some value in, in it. It might just not be, uh, it might just be a different kind of uh, thing. Right. But if you really are in a session where you think, I won't bring anything to that meeting, I won't learn anything, nobody will appreciate me being there, why should I be there? Why could I do this? I can probably spend my time much better for my client or for myself spending on, on somewhere else. And that's that's the kind of thing. And, and I, I recognize what you say, the more I practice this, and I practices first in open space then in conferences and now in meetings with clients and it's yeah you I, I kind of learn it much more um and it's probably is already there in like well i the re one of the reasons why i'm doing this is doing this whole podcast series is uh, talking to people because i want to feel connected it, but it also allows me to say, well, I'm not going to conferences this year because for me, the value of being with my family, first of all, for health reasons, there is a, a lot of things that are important to do. But at the same time, like, like it, it's a big investment to go to the United States or go to Canada from here, like spend a few hours on a plane or actually a lot of hours on a plane. Um, and and at, at this moment, it's like, no, I prefer not to do this. And I prefer to then spend a lot of time recording these kind of things. And, and of course, I'm not with my, while we were talking, my family was eating at, at this point. But at the same time, I know when we're finished, I can just be together with my family. I will sleep in my own bed and, and have other kind of options and other kind of things. And that's, uh, that's the kind of thing you learn much more about options about, okay, what do you value for this? And, Yes. Uh, it, it's yeah. At this point, there is there is a reason for me not to go to conferences, and it's not that I don't miss it. But if I look back, what do I miss most? It's the connection, and that's the kind of connection that we're having now, and we're exactly. having this conversation. So that's uh, that's for me kind of way of experimenting with these kind of things. So and thank noticed, you for sharing. Oh, no, you're welcome. And, I, and I've noticed that actually a lot in you know in these two now over two years. Um, I've really learned that I find it easier to make a connection this way, to feel a connection, I should say, to feel a connection mm -hmm. this way, even though we have all these internet cables between us, um, that it's relatively easy for me to feel connected in this way. Not everyone is like that. And so mm -hmm. if, I can, if I can balance my life better uh, by doing this and still get most of the benefit of that connection then i would rather do that and make it easier for other people who need the physical uh closeness to have it um in whatever way that i can if that means that you know i can charge less for training or i can 
uh, I can do uh, I can do work at more convenient times of the day for the other person, or that uh, I'm just not taking up two extra seats on a flight going from Toronto to Amsterdam, whatever it is. I'm making that space for somebody else. Um, it seems like a very it seems like the least I can do. I mean, why not? Um, and at the same time, if I can help other people who are like me, I can connect with them, they can connect with me, and we can do it more often, and it can be quite meaningful, and we can enjoy it, um, then why should it be necessary to force us to be in the same hotel bar, at the same conference venue, uh, when I would be much more comfortable in my home, and they would be much more comfortable in their home? Let's do that. And and you said something very important there. We can also do it much more regularly. I mean, yes. I've been um, there is the the conference. The uh, well, not the conference. There is the XP. No, the ecstasy event in in London that I I've been to just like two or three times because every time I'm in London during a week on a Tuesday I try to go there. But that's just in the last ten years, like two or three times. Right. And the last year I've been. I think I've been there like ten times, five or ten times because i was able to from my own home i can i can just join them and and do that much more often um and and it's it's impossible i i don't want to go to london every week or every month or everything that's just uh, for multiple reasons not a good idea uh, and like you say it, i can do it much more often from from my own home because there are other things that are more valuable for me i like i said i have uh, a son who's at university i have teenagers so the three of them are, are between 14 and, and and 19 so that's our for me important ages to be there and i also know it's limited so probably in like five to ten year, five to six years all of them might be out of the house or maybe 10 years but these are things like okay i want to spend them as much as home as possible and right. then afterwards i can still travel the world and, and meet people again because that's that definitely if i look back at um well the the, the tom and mary Poppendix of this world that are at uh, much older than than i am and not to, to, to do that negative but I'm like okay right. their, their children are older and they have now the option to travel the world just like Linda Rising and things like that. Yeah, so they're in a different part of their life where that that is again an option. So that's like okay, once I'm that age, I want to do that again. But at this moment, I prefer to stay at home and yeah. and spend that time with with the children. So that's um... and and clearly there's the there's the risk of being paralyzed by choice. We know that's a huge problem. Um, but just like you, when I decide that I. I'm going to attend one of those sessions. Mm -hmm. I'm not just attending a session because I happen to be in the same city during that week and who knows if it will be a topic that's of interest, who knows if it will be, if I will have any connection with the speaker, who knows if I will meet anybody interesting. I know that because I have the option, I can, I can really choose to go when I want to go. And it's easy mm -hmm. to choose to go, and it's easy to choose not to go. I don't have to feel like, oh, well, I'm going through London again, so I have to go to the Extreme Tuesday Club because that's simply what I do whenever I go through London, even though it's the same talk I've heard before or some topic that's not going to interest me at all or I really don't have the energy for it today. Um, Yes, we do have the problem that uh, if it's not rare, then we might never do it. And yes, we have the problem that if we have too much choice, it will be impossible to choose. But I think that if I have to choose between artificial scarcity that forces me to do something and being able to do something because I genuinely have the option and I genuinely want to do it, I'm going to take the second one every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's it's, how it's good. And and like you say, the real options give us a, a lot of chance to to, exactly. to look much more from from our choice much more. Thank right. you and for I sharing do. because that's yeah, yeah that's absolutely. that's really, it's a, it's 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 a good way of looking at um, yeah at personal agility of what we can do and what are options. And I think we we don't think enough about all the options that we get because of this way of thinking. So that's uh, that's a very powerful one. 
I want to go to the next part that, of course, has been part of our lives a lot. And we kind of already talked a little bit about yeah. it, about remote working. And so what is there something that you've learned over the years that you want to share with, with the rest of us? Um, well, so there's, there's, there's one thing that I've learned, and there's actually one thing that I have not been forced to learn yet, which makes me a bit nervous. Um, mm. So I'll start, with, I'll start with the nervous part first. So a lot of the work that I've done remotely has involved a lot of talking uh, or has involved a lot of uh, looking at code on a screen. And those are two things which are relatively easy to do with the technology tools that we have available to us. And a lot of, uh, I have not done a lot of the sort of diagramming, drawing in real time, you know, the, 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 the distance equivalent of three people standing at a whiteboard, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. I've not done a lot of that. I've done almost none of that. That could be that my subconscious mind has decided that I, it's too risky and I don't want to try it. Um, and it could just be coincidence, but. Uh, that's one thing that I, uh, I feel like I don't know what I'm missing. I feel like I don't know what I have failed to mm. learn that would be useful and that I have been missing. Mm. Um, but what I have learned is, uh, exactly what I mentioned a moment ago, that making a genuine connection that I can feel over this two-dimensional screen has been much easier for me than I expected. Mm. Now, it's possible that I'm fooling myself. It's possible that I just have not really experienced, I, I have already forgot the richness of the in-person <coughs> experience of being able to sit across from a table with people, blah, blah, blah. I don't think that's true, but I should admit that it's possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has been, uh, you know, we've been lucky that one person that I, you know, one person that I know from professional circles literally moved a few hundred meters down the street here uh, in the last couple of years. And we have had the opportunity to sit across from each other in, you know, on my picnic table in the back of the house outside drinking wine and talking about everything. Um, so I've had a little bit of that, but not very much. So I suppose it's possible that I have just forgot what it's really like, the difference between us doing this and us sitting across a table in a cafe, drinking wine and, and, and having this kind of conversation. But I don't think so. I hmm. think what's more likely is that, um, you know, perhaps because of how uh, I have changed my worldview over the last 15 years, I find it much easier to see what we are doing now as less constrained and less artificial and that it's not so difficult to make we're not so much constrained in making a real connection and having deep conversations and talking about things that matter and i think that that has um that has had a nice effect on how i work with people i have this nice um mentoring coaching circle of of uh, folks that uh, you know that I spend a few hours with every month uh, doing office hours, um, and we get to talk about some very basic technical um, programming and testing things, but we also get to talk about some quite deep personal things, and I think that the quality of those, uh, the the quality and the significance, the meaning of those conversations has been really high. Uh, we've managed to get quite deep and emotional and make a real connection with each other in a way that previously might have only been possible uh, or might have only seemed possible by being physically in the same space. Mm. And what that means is that I can do that from here with people who are in Central Europe, with people who are in Australia and New Zealand, with people who are in South America, um, and not be limited by the fact that I happen to be going to London and therefore I can go to the XTC this week or that I happen to be going, now I can meet my friends in Stockholm, now I can meet my friends in Vienna, now I can meet my friends in whichever city. Um, and I think that that's, you know, the the, I can connect more deeply with the people 
who want it and who are open to it. Because I don't have to get on a plane to see them and they don't have to get on a plane to see me. You know, because you can, you can, you can, yeah, today or now we can talk and yeah, this yeah. is just, you talk to Belgium and in an hour or two, you can con connect to London or to Australia or whatever, and yeah. you don't need Absolutely. to jump in planes. So you yeah. can actually have this, this rich conversation. Now I have a question that, because we yeah. are talking, but we, 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 well, we know each other for, I don't know, more than 10 years at, at least already. Yeah. So we have already such a connection. Yes. Do you feel that you're able to create these kind of connections with people you've never met? Or is that hard or different for you? Or how do, how do you see that? Well, I can only talk about how it seems to me. And I, I'm mm -hmm. genuinely surprised in a pleasant way by how quickly some of those connections are built. And I think that I can only assume that part of that relates to you know what we talked about previously about uh, how i've changed the way I, I interact with people and and my just sort of general awareness of that kind of thing i i maybe i do a better job of creating an invite an inviting environment um than i would have done if this had happened 15 years before maybe it would be a disaster i don't know um but i mean i've always been the kind of not always been I have for a long time been the kind of person who uh, risks on the side of offering trust earlier. And I think mm. that uh, that's probably only intensified uh, during these two years of the, the you know, of living during these uh, global uh, travel restrictions that, and I, I, maybe that comes through, maybe people can feel it. Uh, maybe there's, enough in the way that i'm saying things enough in the tone of my voice enough in just the, the facial expressions maybe i have learned somehow perhaps by accident to communicate that invitation or to communicate that openness in a way that i didn't do as well 15 or 20 years ago and so assuming that the other person is open to that kind of connection, it seems to happen. Not always on the first conversation, not always immediately, but surprisingly quickly. And um, I don't feel like I'm doing anything differently. That's not quite true. Let me say it a different way. I don't feel like I am trying to make that happen. I feel like I am more able to allow it to happen. That the work that I've done in the last 15 years makes it easier for that genuine part of me to come out. And then the last part of it is sort of related to something very practical, right? I'm a, uh, we are entrepreneurs in some way or another. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to do our own marketing and sales. That's part of what it's like to be independent or a freelancer. Um, we have to learn these things, whether we like them or not. Um, and one of the things that has really changed as internet connections have become more reliable and in more of the world and faster, and it's easier to do things like this with, with video, what it means is that it's easier for us to adopt the marketing strategy of not trying to be what everyone wants, but instead trying to find the people who already want what I am offering and connect with them. It's much easier for me to find the 10,000 people who already like me, but didn't meet me yet. Instead mm. of trying to become the person that 10 million people will like, I can find the 10,000 people who already like me, but they didn't meet me yet. And I already like them, but haven't met them yet. And it's easier for us to find each other now than it has ever been in the past. And I think that that transformation has made this remote working thing much more effective because i think in a sense i'm just i am more often spending time with people who already want to spend more time with me and people with whom i already want to spend more time and i don't have to worry about being lucky enough to meet them in the streets of bratislava being lucky enough to meet them in the streets of stockholm being lucky enough to meet them at the extreme tuesday club it's just much easier for them to find me and for me to find them. And, and and taking planes, because basically then you would spend, I don't know, half a day or more on a plane just oh, to yeah. find them the three people that 
that you can connect with and now you can do it at home and yeah you can connect to multiple people around the world at the same, absolutely more or less at the same time I, I want to bring it connection a little bit to you talked before about real options and about yeah. walking away from options the do you think there is a when you were talking about trust and trust early do you think there is a connection there that you can trust yes. it and like you say I can drop the trust later on, just like any other kind of decision. Is that is there a link there for you, or, or do I probably so? I, I I don't know if one of them comes from the other, or if those two things come from the same place. But yeah, I I, I certainly see the relationship between those two. That, um, I it's and, and and this is maybe one area of my personal privilege that uh, uh, that I can take advantage of that. Um, I am very rarely trapped in a social situation, which means that it's, I almost always have the option of getting away. I mean, I can just, I can just disconnect from this call. Um, I don't have, uh, I don't have contentious family relationships where people are living nearby me and I have to worry about going to another awkward Sunday dinner with uh, some part of the family. I don't have a lot of these kinds of constraints that uh, that make it difficult to escape a bad situation, let's say. And uh, so I, I don't think I engineered this. I think I was lucky enough that it happened this way. Um, some of it wasn't so lucky, but uh, that's a longer story. Um, but what it means is that I have more freedom. I have more freedom to engage with the world on my own terms. And so because I have the freedom to choose to walk away, that means that it's a little bit like what you mentioned before about leaving a meeting. It might feel rude to leave a meeting, but when you and I understand what is happening, and I know that you are choosing to leave a meeting and I trust your motivation, when you choose to stay in a meeting, and I see that you have chosen to stay in the meeting, that choice means something to me more than it would mean to me if you were just there because of professional courtesy or because of enterprise policy or out of some uh, desire to perform for other people. That if you can choose to walk away, then your choice to be there is more significant. It's a bit of a cliche, I, I understand, but I think it's genuinely true. And it allows me to, you know, when I decide to be here, um, it's because I want to be here. And you can believe it that it's because I want to be here. And you can believe that that desire is stronger and it is more meaningful than it would be if this is just because this is something that happens Tuesday afternoons or because it's something that happens whenever I go to Prague. Yeah, it's, it's, it, I think that's really powerful, the, 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 the fact that indeed people like um, uh, Jim McCartney says, we, we want to... Um, yeah, to have heads that count over counting heads. It's like right. when people are there, we, we want them that they, they want to feel that. And then they, people take much more responsibility in, in all these things. And that that brings the trust in all kinds of directions, of course, because I, I trust myself that I'm here because of I want that. And you, you have that trust in the opposite direction. And I think you briefly talked also a little bit about the fact that you can walk away that it, it actually gives you options um i think there is also the remote the fact that people can remote uh, connect to other people it creates some kind of safety because if yes. i would go to a conference and if i would feel unsafe i would still be trapped there yes. if i feel bad about this conference i can just indeed it's one click away to leave the conference and i might still yeah. feel bad about what happens but at least i'm not right. in danger or my life is less in danger right. and i think that adds a lot of i, I see that uh, well probably more for women and for minorities than for for us wild uh, old white men uh, but still there is something that is it is important for the safety of people i think there is a lot there as well and I, and I think it, it you know, it, it, the, the flip side of that's also true, right? This has begin to become a recurring theme for me that when you build in safety, um, you're not only more safe, but you can be open to more risk. And I think that um, what that allows me to do is to uh, 
I can trust myself more when I find myself in spaces which were not made for me. And what I mean by that mm. is I can trust myself more to um, I can trust myself more to engage people. I'm having a hard time articulating what I mean, but essentially it, it feels less like a performance. It feels less awkward. It feels less artificial. It feels more genuine. The connections which I make are more genuine. I can make those connections more easily with a wider variety of people. I can feel more comfortable around a wider variety of people because in the worst case, if they kick me out or if I need to withdraw because something's gone wrong, yeah, I'll feel bad about it for a while, but I can let go of that much more easily than I would if I'm stuck in a hotel and I have to see these people at breakfast the next day and I have to see them down the hall in the office or any of those kinds of things. I have more space to just, and this is part of my introverted nature. I have more space that I can just go away, mm -hmm. feel and, whatever and I feel, and come back. Re-energize, exactly. Re-energize yeah. yourself. And that's like you say, a lot of introverts need this much more. Um, yeah. And I, I think it, it's, again, we're looking into the dangers of, um, of um, yeah, um, saying too much in, in cliches, but I think a lot of introverts prefer or have it easier in the remote world than extroverts. Extroverts, yeah. they, they need too much more in the physical uh, closeness of, of others to, to charge and get that energy. And I think with more introverted people uh, feel feel a lot of that. Again, it's it's cliche, so there's a lot of dangers to talk about that. But uh, I think there's definitely some something to, to learn about that. But but that said, I'll, I'm going to warn you out there, any of you who are watching, when I when I when I do see you in person, I'm going to want to hug you. You're going to have to stop. Me. Uh, it's, it's, all you have to do is just put your hand out like that. It's it's not like I want to stay away from you people. But uh, once again, you know, as an introvert who has who can uh, have extroverted tendencies when it's needed, um, who still enjoys performing on stage, but also needs to spend time by himself. I, you know, I'm lucky. I feel like I have the best of both worlds. And yes, it sucks that I don't get to hug you right now. Uh, I'm going to feel good about it when I get there. But I can also accept the fact that it's been a while, and that's okay too. I, I, there is a lot of with just the last sentences that you said that I recognize. If you look back, if I look back at myself when I was young, like somewhere between I don't know five six years till till 18 19 i was really the biggest introvert that 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 most people know but thanks to agility i was able to to recognize and to discover that extroverted part of me and yeah. i i partially done it already as a dj okay because then i was also performing and, and and discovering it but in the agile world talking on stage and a lot of that i i, I really like you say discovered that part and and liked it and i like the hugging part and and the, the interesting thing is for me that i for me it feels much more like an, an ambivert like okay i can really get a lot of energy at an agile conference but put me back it um at my high school with my with the the, the the people that were in my high school with the same people even at age 50 it, it it i love to be there i just had a reunion a month or two ago and oh, wow. i loved it I, I i i love to talk with these people but it took me it it, it cost a lot of energy after yeah. that evening i i was I, I was just drawn i didn't have any energy where if i would have spent that same evening at an agile conference i know i would have just had grown in energy so it's it's a different kind of thing uh, but like you say, we, we need to adjust and probably in the next, I don't know, two, three years, once the pandemic is really over, and I'm not sure if we're already there, it's somewhere in between. Mm. Um, but once it gets over, we'll probably need to adjust a little bit to, to that, to that, a lot of that. And I'd like to take this as an opportunity to say again to the people who are listening, and especially to the people who are listening in the near future, over the next few years, who happen to stumble upon this video, um, please let's not forget everything that we learned about uh, about how sociable we can be like this. I'm not saying that I want this to be our only way of, of communicating, but mm. I don't want us to go back to undervaluing this just because we feel comfortable getting on a plane again. Um, 
I hope that we can find ways to do both. I'm hoping that conferences will allow themselves to have online versions. I'm hoping that clients will still understand the value of being able to do this work where you can hire me for an hour and a half instead of for a day and we can get good work done, even if it's not all the same. Um, the, you know, these are, this isn't just valuable as a professional, but this is also part of what it means for us to stay connected with each other throughout the year. So that, you know, we, we will love to go back and spend our Schengen approved 90 days in Europe in a six month period and be with people on site at conferences and all that good stuff and have the richness of working that way. But I hope that doesn't mean that the other eight months of the year, I sit here and you sit there and we don't talk to each other. There's no reason to yeah. do that. What I, I like, like that to have is yeah. more ongoing relationships with people that have elements of both being in person and doing this. I think that that's going to be, this is something that we in the Agile community have wanted to do for a long, long time. And now we have the tools and now it's socially acceptable to do it. Let's please do it. Yeah, I, I like that because indeed I've, I've been saying for, I think more than 15 years, I give what I call free lifetime support. And right. from time to time, people take me up on that. And usually it's about about email and, and maybe a phone call. But in the last two years, there's actually been some video conversations with people. And I've been hired, like you say, an hour here, an hour there, two hours there. And, and yeah, it, it would never be possible to go back to an old client that is in a different country just for an hour or two, because it would right. just be too expensive to jump on a plane to go in a hotel and then meet someone for an hour and then just leave. And and then they need to find ways, how can we afford to, to hire you for a full day? But yeah, maybe we don't need you for a full day and how do right. we deal with that? And one party or the other is going to lose. Either you pay me for a day or two and then maybe I don't bring that full value, so I feel bad about that. Either you just hire me for an hour and I lose an hour, a day or two just going to you and I lose and, and maybe you feel bad about it. So this is much, yeah, like you say, there is much more options here that we have. And let's let's explore this in the coming years. Right, um, let's do years. both. It turns let's out they both work. So let's try doing both. Why not? Everybody exactly. wins. Exactly. Everybody wins. I want to go because it, it feels like uh, we're talking already for a long time. I want to go to that next question about yes. a book. What's, well, I, I said originally, what's the last book or what's a good book that you have read yeah. that you want, want to talk about? Yeah, so one that I've just finished uh, in the last few days uh, is called Intangibles uh, by Joan Ryan. Um, it's, it was a fun book for me because um, I'm, I'm a baseball fan and so a, a book that's uh, rooted in what causes team chemistry, baseball is a very natural domain to discuss this question. It's a very hot topic in, uh, in baseball in particular because baseball is one of those games with a strange mixture of individual and team. It's a team game, but at the end of it, uh, just like in cricket, uh, the, the, you know, the, 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 most of the action happens between a small number of individuals and then occasionally the entire team has to work together and a lot of the teamwork sort of happens away from the game it happens in training it happens in um before the game and after the game it happens inside the clubhouse blah 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 and so mm. although most of the storytelling is about baseball of course there are there are references to uh general mccrystal and team of teams there's a uh, uh, references uh, in the business environment. And the central question is, what is team chemistry? What does it even mean? Uh, and then, of course, if it exists and the effect is real, how do we create it? And as you might expect, the book doesn't have a lot of strong answers because it's an extremely complex topic. But what we do seem to know, what we have been able to learn so far, is that uh, team chemistry is a real effect. I know Jerry Weinberg wrote about it in the psychology of computer programming in 1972. You know, the, the person who never seems to do anything but success follows them. That's an example of the, the, the effect of team chemistry. Um, team chemistry does exist. 
It is real. It has a real effect. The effect is significant. But we don't know very much about how to create it. We do know that there is a reliable way to detect when it's happening. It mm. seems to be, there seem to be two stages, at least two stages of when a group behaves like a team. And the first stage is when the group aligns around a common purpose. This is sort of like the, you know, this is paying the minimum it takes to actually play the game of poker. Until you have this common purpose and you see people who are agreeing on a common purpose and who are changing their behavior to align with the common purpose, team chemistry won't happen. So that's kind of the first stage. The stage where team chemistry really seems to be happening, however, is the point where the team is no longer only agreeing about a common purpose and behaving in support of a common purpose. But when they start behaving in a way where they are openly, uh, they are openly trying to achieve not for the common purpose, but for each other. That the point where my uh, effort, my focus, my uh, motivation switches from our common purpose to I'm performing for you and you're performing for me on a personal level. That is the point at which team chemistry seems to be happening. And this seems to be a reliable indicator that team chemistry is happening. It, it reminds me a lot about what uh, Jim and Michelle McCartney talk about in, in the core protocols, because yeah. when, when I've been to a boot camp of them, they focus a lot in the first two days about understanding each other and understanding the, the goals of each other. So basically, yes. in the first two days of that training, you really work hard on what is your purpose, what do you want to achieve? Yeah and talking to each other that we understand. And miraculously, a few days later, we there is a team. And, yeah. and the only thing, the only, and I, between brackets, that, that we do is talk about what we want to achieve. Right. And, and, and that in that training, there is not really a common purpose while we want to learn about teams and, and how teams behave. But before that training, in a lot of cases, I, I've been to a few or I organize a few of these which were open training. So there was no real team. There was no company that everybody and it, yeah, I, I recognize a lot of what you say that. So it sounds like a very interesting book to, to read yeah. and to learn about. Unfortunately, I don't know how you take a group of people from stage one to stage two. And I don't think the author does either. I think that you create the environment in which it might happen. And sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. And it doesn't last forever. And sometimes it doesn't last for very long. But when it happens, you can really see it. And those two things seem to be reliable indicators that it's happening. You just tend the garden and the flowers bloom or they don't. Well, like I said, I've been to to, to McCarthy training where they seem to have discovered some of that. But like you say, it, it, yeah. it's easy to go away because I've seen a team that was really gelled in that training where they had something that they wanted to do. And then it kind of dropped away in, in the next weeks after that training, uh, which is not on, on logical because there was no team and there was no group of right. course anymore. Um, but, but like you say, it's, it's interesting to, to talk about. It's also, it kind of explains how it's much easier to create a team in, in a group sports, for example, because you have a common goal. You want to win a match, you want to win a competition, yeah. you want to win something. And yeah, there is so much talk into, into organizations about we want to have a common purpose and we want to, and somehow we don't always have it. Or in a lot of cases, companies are, they kind of invent the purpose, but the people don't feel it and are they, right. yeah, it's, so it's, uh, there's a lot there that, that is still to discover. So uh, I, I, I wonder what will happen if some enterprise somewhere has the courage to allow their employees and even encourage their employees to say openly, I'm here for the money and to start there. And my guess is that even if the common purpose starts there, if you allow that communication to happen openly, it won't stop there. That they will mm. find, uh, if you like, a higher purpose than just we're here for the money. 
Um, I, you know, that's the one thing that makes me uh, feel that makes it feel the most artificial to me. A lot of this stuff about companies trying to, you know, uh, promote uh, common missions and mission statements and these kinds of things. I think the cynicism isn't necessarily because the mission of the company is wrong. But I think that driving these discussions about the practical reality that I exchange my time for money, and this is the economic system we have agreed to live in, if you, if you push that underground, I think you're denying too much reality. If we allow that conversation to happen openly, somebody somewhere is going to figure out that that's not the end of the world, that in fact, that might be the beginning of real connection with people. I'm here, when, you know, when I practice TV, I'm in it for the money. When I practice extreme programming, I'm in it for the money. I know that if I, if I am better at my craft and I can work with less stress, I'm more valuable to the people around me and I can more efficiently trade my time for money, whether it's as an employee or as an investor or as someone trying to build a company. And I think we do a, mm -hmm. I think we make a big mistake when we decide to try to pretend that that doesn't exist. Mm. Yeah, the, the, the thing is, um, I've noticed the, the um, yeah, what is it? I don't, I don't know the exact word, but I've noticed already a lot when, when consultants are talking, well, we need to have a higher purpose and we, we don't, for example, the whole thing about bonuses, bonuses yeah. are bad and whatever, but who are the people that saying that bonuses are bad? They're all the consultants that are making a lot of money and, yeah. and the internal people want the bonuses because yeah, that's, that's part of the money, how it's working. And, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always in, in duality about it. Yes, I see how bonuses create uh, bad habits in teams and, and how things are making them individuals. But at the same time, I also see that the people who are against it are the consultants who are making a lot more money than the internal people. Yep. So that, that, yeah, there is some duality about that. And, and, and definitely I'm part of it. That's the same thing. It's like, okay, where do we end, end in doing that? And that's the, that's all kind of thing. It's, um, it's an interesting discussion that, uh, yeah, that we're and in that world that we're living. Uh, and like you say, because of that money and because of, we have our own businesses, we're, we have a lot of options that allow us to make decisions that allow us again, to become much more stable and much more focusing on our core. And that helps us to become better. And because we become better, our clients are more happy. And that's a, it's a whole cycle that, that starts all over again. That's, um, yeah. I didn't expect us to go into that direction when we were talking about that book, but somehow it turns that we, we run into this kind of thing. Doesn't surprise me. No, and that's the same thing. It doesn't surprise me at all. But at the same time, yeah, it, I wasn't looking at that. I didn't expect it, but not surprising. Okay, I want to go to, for me, one of the most interesting questions about um, what question do you think I should ask you and, and what's the answer? Um, well, so since this series is called Who is Agile? I guess the question you should ask me is, are you still agile? Mm, wow, that's uh, a very profound one. Yeah, and uh, I think the very short answer to that question is uh, it depends on the tone of voice when you say agile. <laughs> and this is, you know, mm. I, I, I don't want to get into the details here because that could easily take two hours. Uh, anyone who wants to have that discussion with me, if you do meet me in the conference bar, uh, then that's a conversation I'm really happy to have. But the extremely short version of it is that I have, I have gradually over the last few years felt uh, less of a connection to the Agile community, not because of anything about Agile, but because I feel a little bit like, um, I just feel a little bit like the, the, some of the directions, some of it has moved on without me. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want anyone to feel any pity for me. And I don't really even feel bad about it. I think it's just that, um, what, what is popular about agile has changed and the things which are popular about agile are not the things that interest me as much anymore. What's I find in what I find curious. So for example, I have been using the term lightweight much more often in the last two years 
And I like to talk about mm -hmm. having a lightweight approach to software development because lightweight is the is one of the aspects of agile that has always been um it was what drew me in you know if you think of agile as essentially lightweightness plus humanity um and i guess even if you want to say iterative is part of it you could kind of say something like that but agile is really lightweight plus iterative plus uh humane and um, the lightweight part is what initially drew me. That was what made me, that was what attracted me to extreme programming. It solved the problems that I had at the time when I needed them solved. And that was what I remember. It's, if you want, it's what I'm most grateful for, for launching my career, the lightweightness of Agile. And that's what I like to teach to other people. Not because I think it's the most important, but it's actually maybe the easiest to teach. And if it's the easiest to teach, then maybe it is a good starting point for other people that they can sort of start by learning about the lightweightness, the lightweightness in their practice, the lightweightness in their thinking, and they'll learn the rest later. I trust them that if the humanity part of it is important to them, they'll learn about it. If the iterative part of it is important to them, they'll learn about it. I don't need to expose them to it. They'll be attracted to it either way. Um, Interesting, because in, in that sense, you, you also say that they discover the things that they're needed. And, and also, you didn't yeah. say it, but I kind of heard it also in the order that they need it. But, and yes, that order at the might time, be completely, exactly. that, that order could be and will be completely different than you. The order Absolutely. that you discover things and I discovered. Yeah, that's, that's. I mean, as, uh, we've, as we've had in this discussion, you know, the humanity part of it has been by far the most significant change for me over the last 20 years. But it's not where I started, and it's not what I was interested in 20 years ago. It's not what I needed. If someone had tried to teach me all that stuff, in fact, people did try to teach me all that stuff 20 years ago, and none of it got in. Right? I needed, yeah, that's I needed time to do other things. Yeah, it's 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 like you said. You mentioned the book that the first book. I think it's the first book from Jerry Weinberg, the Psychology of Computer Programming. It's like that was in there that that existed way before agile and a right. lot of us discovered and we keep discovering and it's one of these books that i i from time to time yeah. open up again and i read and like wait was it in yeah it's the same book it's the it, yeah. I, it, it was already there and why didn't i understand it now i seem to understand it and maybe i did understand it and i forgot it in the meanwhile right. probably but there's still so much depth in it and, and so much exactly. things to, to learn and to relearn. And, and yeah, I, I like that. And I also like, well, you said lightweight. It, 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 I don't use it that often as, as you probably do, but I recognize it in the sense that sometimes, like for me, when you said it, and some of the sentences you said made me also think about the low-hanging fruit. Sometimes it's good that people have low-hanging fruit because they learn something and then they discover, oh, there might actually be more. And the low hanging fruit is n usually not the most interesting part, but at least they got it got them interested, and then they yes. will learn more. Like just like you learn from XP, exactly. Um, it gives them confidence. It gives them a place to start, and it gives them the feeling that they don't need to learn everything at once. Mm, yes, and it's uh, and in that sense, I recognize a lot. Like, well. When you say agile community moved on, I think we we broadened a lot because you learned a lot about human and and other people learned about I don't know project management with Scrum and right. with Kanban and other kind of things and and you learned the things that you needed and people learned other exactly. things that you needed uh, or they needed and 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 sometimes we discover some other parts. Oh, okay, there is something in in Kanban that is interesting for me. I learn a few tricks and then I go back to the yeah. human thing I need to learn and that's. Uh, and for me, that is where that community has broadened them so much. But what I don't feel, and this is where, I, I don't know if that's what you're pointing to, but what I see a lot of in, in some of the communities, they want to make one big model out of it and that this will work for everybody. No, actually, I'm much more interested in what will work for me at the, my right. current client. And what are the variations? That, exactly and that's a very small toolbox that i need now but that's based on the toolbox that larger toolbox that i have at home and that i don't take with me all the time because it's well it's also way too much to take it with me all the time like when we travel i don't want to bring my whole closet with me i'll just take a few 
a few t-shirts and a few pants and a few books with me and and a laptop and, and a phone and that's it and and then i'll that's good enough for a few days or a week of work and then i want to go back and then the next week i'll take another pick uh, another t-shirt with me because that, that that's uh, that's a different kind of thing yeah, i so like I that that the thing I really think it's the trends that have kind of moved on without me. And this could be temporary. It could just be that this is a 10 year period where what a large part of the agile community is interested in is not the stuff that I'm interested in or where, you know, the, the, because the, the, the community has become so big, it's become bigger too fast for me to be able to feel connected with people. It was much easier to feel connected with people when there were 250 of us in a conference than when there were 2000 of us at a conference, right? Just basic numbers. And I think that's part of what's happening now is I feel like I'm going a little bit more back to my roots. And I wonder if that really merely reflects my desire to reconnect with the community that I miss from 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And this is why it's really gratifying mm. for me. I've done a lot more of talking to old folks, um, in part because I want to reconnect with the old folks, not because they're old, but because I miss them. I miss you folks. And that's what mm. makes it so easy for me to say yes when someone like you reaches out to me and says, hey, we haven't talked in a long time. I just did this thing with with Hill, um, you know, two weeks ago, um, because James Shore invent, you know, invited us to his uh, Art of Agile Development uh, book club. Um, mm. Any kinds of opportunities to come that when they come up, I jump on them immediately because it allows me to reconnect with the people who we were sitting across from, you know, the table at the cafe or the bar or the hotel bar at two o'clock in the morning and yelling at each other and having fun, and. Um, I want more of that. And that's another one of these things that's happening as a result of, of us becoming more comfortable doing the stuff online is we get to do this and we get to talk for two and a half hours and it feels like, you know, mm. not, not any time has passed. Exactly. I, I said in the beginning, before we started, let's, this will take an hour and a half and look here, this is the longest conversation I've recorded so far. And it still feels like, yeah, it, I, I'm pretty sure that my partner will say, how did you talk so long? But it feels like it's just like 10 minutes ago that we started. Yes, uh, and I, I, I apologize for everybody listening in that. Uh, but I assume that if it takes too long, that they'll all be gone. So I hope that uh, the, there are still people here. Well, if you're still here, put it in the comment what you like and what exactly. made you connect because that's the interesting thing. I want to go back and I know it will take us again to a five or 10 minutes conversation, but when you talked about this, this small conferences, 20, 25, uh, 200 people, things like that, could that be a reason why you connect so nicely with Europe? Because for me, it feels like in Europe, we always have very small, we kind of scaled out with a lot of yeah. small conferences, where in yes. the United States is the big one and we scale yes. up or you scaled up. Yes. And, Absolutely, yes. And then what's funny is that the, um, the XP conference came to Montreal in 2019. Um, I, you know, when the Agile Alliance took over the XP conference, one of the first things they did was they decided that they wanted to move it out of Europe, make it more international. And so they came to Montreal in 2019. And when I heard that, I said, well, I absolutely have to go. Uh, I've been complaining that the, the big North American conference has now now the big North American conference has not been in Canada since 2008. So yeah, I was that was, the last I was, I was in, that was in Toronto, right? In Toronto, yeah. exactly. Um, so when the, when the XP conference was in 2019 in Montreal, I said, this is absolutely perfect. We have f three or 400 people. It's a two hour uh, plane ride away from me. I don't have to leave, uh, I don't have to pass uh, 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 an international border. Of course, I'm going to go. And it felt exactly like what I remember from the days of going to Limerick or Oulu or any of those other, you know, smaller places. Um, it was in a university, so it had exactly that same feeling of the, the XP conference always taking place in some university somewhere. Um, and yeah, it did feel exactly like what I wanted, what I, where I feel comfortable and mm. where I had the chance to really have more than a 12 minutes conversation with 120 different people.
but could really sit and reconnect with some people that I hadn't uh, spoken to in five years, 10 years, 15 years. Um, that is absolutely where I feel more comfortable. And that makes it much easier to go to Agile Central Europe or to go to um, CraftConf or DevConf or um, uh, any of these other places where um, uh, Devternity, I'm trying to remember the names of all these various conferences that I've been to in Europe over the last 10 years where I really feel like home. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, unfortunately, that's just not the feeling I get when there are 2,000 people in the building. And part of that is just me. Part of that is economic reality. Um, and that's, you know, one of the things that I'm really hoping that we can continue even after the big conferences come back, that we can still have something like this where we get to. I will say one thing. Here's a format I love. I want to see more of this. So if you're out there and you want to run an event, please do this. Ask the speakers to pre-record their talks and then let them do commentary in the chat while everybody watches the video. Keep the mm. conference short, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. I experienced this a couple of years ago and I absolutely loved it. You are chatting and then when the video is over, then there can be 15 or 20 minutes. Turn on the microphones, give everyone, give everyone a chance to talk to each other. Get that initial connection over this shared love of a concept or, uh, or a technology or whatever it is, an idea. And it will be much more likely that those people will then hang out somewhere and have a, a, a more meaningful conversation. And that's something that's not so easy to do in person. Well, I have, um, I wanted to immediately go to that, um, to an example where we did it in, in, in person. That is the AL conference, the Agile yeah. in Europe conference, where they, the idea was we do, um, indeed 20 to 25 minute uh, talks. So that's in person and that's in the morning. In the morning, you only have like 25 minutes conversation, uh, talks. And so speakers have not enough time to talk everything. But yeah. just enough to, to do and and in 25 minutes you have to bring the core of your message you have to yeah. not fillers and whatever the, the core of your message and then in the afternoon there is um, open space things and then yeah. people can bring in completely different talks but in many cases they're like okay jeff or peter talked about this kind of thing and yeah. let's have a conversation around that and that's for me indeed this is where the interaction happens and that's yeah. uh, but it's hard to organize it because somehow a lot of us feel if there is uh, actual talks and there's open space the combination is really hard and for me the ale conference is the only one that was able to to yeah. do them both because basically they said in the morning it's one thing and in the afternoon it's the other that's uh, that helps a lot to, to bring absolutely that kind of interaction add nap time and everyone's happy <laughs> yes, that's that's the other part. Um, okay, it's it's been really really fun, and it's yeah. Again, you answered that last question in a really uh, great way. I want to go to that very last question, which is, um, what is uh, who do you think I should ask next? What's a person that I should? Invite? Oh, this is really hard. I you know I. I just really don't know. There's uh, this is actually I, I'm gonna in a way I'm gonna not answer the question um, mm. because I this is part of the answer to the previous question. I feel so disconnected now from where the 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 agile community has gone, and I worry that too many of my references, if you will, are outdated, and that's why I'm not really sure who I want to. I'm thinking now about it, and I don't even remember who it was that I answered by email. I'm pretty sure I gave you an answer, but I don't remember who it was that I even suggested. Um, well, well, before you go into that, uh, before I show you, because I, I, I don't remember the name. I, I have a picture right. of the person, but it's a person ah, okay. I don't know. But um, what, what I find interesting is, and, and this brings it actually to what you said earlier on, and that's why I want to, to jump in, is that... Um, you, you said you reconnect to a lot of the older people. And one right. of the things I wanted to ask at that time is that what I've noticed is that a lot of the young people might not know older people. I don't, yes. I think it's, 
Jip Jason talked about some people don't know who's Jeff Patton. It's like what? Right. How, how? Who doesn't know Jeff Patton? Who doesn't know Lisa Atkins and 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 all these other kind of things? And right. and who doesn't know, like you said, Jerry Weinberg? So okay, right. he's deceased now, but but there's a lot of things that are interesting there. So that <coughs> I'm sorry. So you could bring in some of these people that you say these are the people that are interesting because that's that's also one part and right. then we can go to, to the new people so before are there any other people that you say in the past that was a person that i think a lot more people should know is there some of these uh, names that you have? yeah actually there so there is one who comes to mind uh who's kind of one of those people that i remember from the very early days of the extreme programming community but then someone who sort of you know, uh, started doing his own thing and, you know, didn't, uh, didn't become a, a, a freelance consultant who depended on marketing in the agile space to make money. Um, but who is sort of a little bit famous for, um, for saying, you know, XP ain't out there, it's in here. Um, and that's mm -hmm. Bill Caputo. Um, mm. Bill Caputo, uh, I haven't spoken to him probably now in at least 15 years and maybe closer to 20. He was one of those people that if you go back and you look at the old, old, old extreme programming, uh, Yahoo group was one of those people who was oh, writing messages just like everybody else was, by the way, you can go to groups.io now and you can find the extreme programming group. All 100,000 messages are still there. There's over 20 years of archive. Wow. There. And read about how stupid we were in the early days of extreme programming. You can still find it. Um, Bill's one of those people who was involved in a lot of those early conversations. He was a prolific writer, very thoughtful. And um, if nothing else, I would be curious to know how he feels about whether he feels any connection to the idea of agile anymore or not i genuinely don't know that's the reason why he comes to my mind because he was you know he's one of those people who was um such a present part of the community for a few years 20 years ago and then just seemed like he faded away and i lost track and you know i want to know what happened that's that's really nice, and this is why I, for most invitations, I wait till I send out where I publish the video, and then only I send an invitation because that's the kind of message that will hopefully inspire him to reconnect and say yes, I want to to do this kind of thing. Of course, if he if he wants to listen to the two hour and a half before <laughs> we go to the invitation, I would be surprised. Then, yeah but even then i can just link to the of course the last uh, exactly um okay and then i want to show let's let's go for the uh, next person the person that you um that you invited oh and that's of course the... yes esther daniel to bring yes so you know one of the nice things about um being involved in uh all this travel is of course being able to see the smaller communities uh, around Europe. And so uh, Esther is someone that I got a chance to meet. Uh, oh, geez, very early on, I think in, in my travels, especially when I was regularly speaking or uh, uh, traveling to um, Eurodev conference uh, in uh, Malmö, Sweden. And so, um, you know, one of those people that you meet and you just kind of have an immediate connection with an immediate affinity for. And Esther has been uh, quite active in especially in the, um, in the community oriented around uh, empathy in professional environments, mm. uh, empathy in software development, uh, and particularly, uh, you know, in the community of computer programmers who still, even with everything that we've learned about the importance of empathy and compassion, who are still somewhat famous for having a bit of a deficit of empathy and compassion, who are slowly waking up to, uh, you know, how important this is, not just in life, but in work. And so I think they would be a, a, a wonderful, um, a wonderful example of more of the starting by understanding the humanity and adding the software development practice to it, rather than as I did, starting with the software development and adding the humanity 
to it in a way, mm. making the transition from programmer to human um, to really hear from somebody who uh, has been able to blend, you know, humanity and professional work from the beginning. And so I'd really be uh, curious to see how they, uh, you know, hear more about their story in that regard. Okay, that's wonderful. So these are two people who are really interesting to to get to connect and, and to add to this. So thank you very much. Well, and thank you for the whole time. It's almost three hours that we're here. So if people that are still here want to connect with you, what would be a good way to, to, to connect with you? Well, the easiest thing is to go to jbrains.ca, as you can see here. Um, you're always welcome to visit ask.jbrains.ca to ask me a question. And as long as you are happy to wait an indefinite period for the answer, uh, then that service costs nothing. And if you need a better service level agreement, then we can talk about how much that costs. It's probably less expensive than you think. Um, and uh, ask me anything about anything. And if I don't have a good answer, then I will be very clear about that. And then otherwise, if I, if I think there is some training or some consulting or some mentoring or some coaching that uh, you might benefit from, I promise you, I will be direct about it. And you buy from me, you buy from someone else, you're not going to hurt my feelings. That's the easiest way you can find me. And I would say, I think also when you think that you're not the best to answer, that you're pretty open about that as well. I think that's been, uh, I think at least my experience. I don't remember anymore at, at what point, but I do remember at some point that I connected with you that you said, okay, this or that person might be better. So yeah. that's uh, that's indeed one of the openness and the the well both I think it's kind uh, to to actually just be honest and brutal about okay maybe for this kind of thing that you want I might not be the best person to answer yeah. it and then person else. It's nice to be more when I'm more secure about what I know then I'm also more secure about what I don't know. Exactly. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. And uh, we'll, like you say, we'll, uh, we still have a hug for each other when we Absolutely. meet again. Uh, yes. So, I can't wait for it. Bye bye. Thank you for watching Who's Agile, where the stories of agilists come to life. I hope you liked today's interview. Subscribe if you're not subscribed and want to get to know other agilists.